Okay, I think we're all in for now. If there's other people, please just let them in. Um, we'll start by just stating a, a few things. Let me get my phone. So because we're on Zoom, we've, uh, we want to express some of the kind of the protocols as well as just the um, issues that can come with, with Zoom. So I read this the last board meeting or at the commission meeting, sorry, but uh, I want to read it each time we're on a Zoom meeting. So while we are mindful of the right of the public to participate and observe the deliberations of their government, the results of COVID and this Zoom platform find us conducting the public's business in our private spaces. With that in mind, we may need to step away for a moment because of the day-to-day -day life that happens in our private spaces, but we commit to being as visible as possible while deliberating and conducting business. Also be reminded that the chat is not for discussion um, or statements. That is to put your name for, uh, to be acknowledged so that public can, can have time for public comment. So remember that chat is not for bantering back and forth. All right, so tonight we have a special meeting uh, a budget meeting and the commission is called together along with the public to uh, look through our budget again, our general uh, fund. And we're gonna start with Michael giving us an overview. And I know there are some uh, wants from the commission and from the community in and that certain points during this conversation we'll stop for public comment and or commissioner comment but we need to get a, a sort of a, a overview of what is in the general fund budget the process that it it takes to create the general fund or the budget and and what we do with it as we go um as we get together as a commission and as a community so i'm going to leave it up to Mike to start with, and Paige, I'm sure we'll give some feedback in certain places, and we'll start from there. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we'll just do a brief overview of the budget process, uh, where the funds come from, what they can be spent on, uh, kind of how it's broken down through uh, the different types of funds, but we will try and do that in as simple and an understandable a a method as possible. So if you have the agenda with you, I will try and reference agenda pages and not budget pages, uh, just for your reference. Um, to start out with, the city's budget is broken up into multiple types of funds. Um, and when we say funds, we're not talking actual bank accounts, we're just talking um, how the money is accounted for in uh, through the accounting process, through the government accounting process. So the the biggest types of funds that we have, uh, there's some other little ones as well, but the biggest is either the general fund or uh, enterprise funds. There are some permanent funds, there are some uh, debt funds, some bond funds, some other little ones that we do throughout the process. But the two biggest types by far are enterprise funds and the general fund. And they're, um, the revenues come from two separate uh, pots of money um, and they have to operate independently. So enterprise funds are any fund that pays for itself. So it's a fee-based fund. Uh, in most cities, enterprise funds and the big ones we have are gonna be water, sewer, solid waste, and ambulance is sort of an enterprise fund because it does bring in some revenue. Uh, we list it as an enterprise fund, but it also takes uh, some tax money as well. So those funds are set by, um, the revenue is set by the fees we charge for the service. So depending on what the water rate is, what the sewer rate is, what the cost is for your solid waste, that's the money that is used to provide those services. Um, that money can't be used anywhere else. So uh, that includes street maintenance, light maintenance districts. So if you say, which are different types, they're not enterprise funds, but they're the same kind. Um, they have specialized revenue that can only be used in those funds. So you can't just raise water rates and then use that money somewhere other than water, or you can't um, cut a street project and then use those savings to pay for, um, a new planner or something like that. They're sequestered into those types of funds. So when we're talking the major major fund types, 
the fees for water, sewer, and solid waste are kind of set. They're set on what it costs to run that system. So they're based not on um, property value or anything else, but just how many uh, customers we have, how much they use the service, and then the funds we need to pay for both operational costs to include uh, personnel in the water and sewer department, but also the capital projects such as improvements to upgrade water mains, to replace sewer mains, whatever it is, those are separated out into enterprise funds. Um, or in the case of street maintenance, that's a set amount, but that is actually brought in through property taxes. So that's a different kind of fund. Um, but again, those funds are restricted to street maintenance. You can't even build a new road with those. It can only be used to do things like uh, patch roads, so pothole patching, chip sealing, snow removal, um, road repair, those kind of things. And that's where those, those funds come from. We can supplement that with some of the gas tax money from the state, but again, that's restricted to be used only for roads and streets that are existing. So that's it. So then you get to the general fund and the general fund is kind of a different animal. So general fund is funded mainly through, um, mainly through property taxes, but also through some other state funding sources uh, to include entitlement funds um, and some other grants that come through the state. Uh, but in general, you can think of the general fund as being supported by property taxes. Uh, as far as that goes, the general fund is unrestricted in what you can use it for. You can use it for all the items in the general fund, but if you needed to uh, support the uh, solid waste department with buying something, you could use general fund monies for that because the general fund is just that. It's for any, any need within the city. So you can use general fund money outside the general fund, but you can't use money gained outside the general fund in the general fund. Um, there's some little exceptions to that and some administrative ways that other funds pay their way with the cost of what they use out of the general fund. We call that administrative cost allocation. So because the water department or the sewer department uh, or the roads department has to occasionally use services that are paid for out of the general fund, such as finance or uh, the city attorney, they pay fees into the general fund that can then be used to cover those costs. So those are the biggest types of funds and those are the general areas on where revenues come from. Uh, we can, you can dig down a lot more into specific revenues in the general fund. Um, there's things like uh, fines from parking tickets and um, some money we get for renting out parking spots. So there's a lot of other small revenue sources, but the only significant ones really are entitlement share and um, property taxes. So that's where those fall. Um, so when you're looking at creating the budget, you treat those funds separate and distinct. So you go through the enterprise funds, you budget them what they're required for either capital improvements or operating costs, and those are done with the fee-based structure that you have for those. Um, but when you get to the general fund, it's a little more complicated because there's a lot of functions that fall into the general fund. Uh, so you have to kind of figure out um, how you're going to allocate those resources across all the different um, departments. So when you're talking about departments inside the general fund or what is supported by those tax dollars, it's basically your administration or other uh, functions that don't fall neatly into anything else. So uh, my office, the city manager's office, the city attorney's office, the finance office, the rec department, um, parks and trails costs come out of the general fund, uh, the police department comes out of the general fund, the fire department comes out of the general fund, uh, part of the ambulance comes out of the general fund. Um, planning and building, all of some of the public works staff. Um, did I miss anybody in there? Uh, but those are, those are the, the general departments all come out of the same pot of money. So you don't really have a budget for the fire department and a budget for the city attorney. It's all within the general fund. Now you do split it up and, and um, put it out there as far as how much goes to each section of the general fund, each department inside the general fund, but it's one pot of money. And if you take it away from one area, uh, you can give it to a different area inside the general fund. So you could um, cut the number of firefighters and use some of that money that you saved to build a new trail or to um, hire an additional planner or a building inspector. So you have to shift those around um, and look at your priorities within all of the departments to figure out how to keep all the city functions um, working and to hit as many of the priorities as you can within the limit of the money you have because the city can't raise taxes um, for the general fund. We don't have the, uh, the authority. The commission can't do it. Uh, the county couldn't do it for the, their general fund. 
the state is, controls the amount of taxes that the city will receive through property taxes. And they have limited that to a growth rate of one half the rate of inflation over the past three years. Uh, it's kind of a complicated formula and it involves some of the uh, consumer price index, a specific one for small um, intermountain uh, cities, but they tie the growth to that. So when people are saying the city's raising my taxes because they wanted to buy something new, um, we don't have any authority to do that. Uh, the state determines that somebody's taxes may go up, but it's usually because their property was assessed or reassessed and went up in value. So they're paying a higher share of the taxes, but the overall tax coming into the city is the same or it grows at one half that rate, unless there are new properties that come into the city. So like Green Acres was annexed, those properties will come into the city. They won't be this tax year because there's a lag in the tax rules, but next tax years, next tax year, the Green Acres property taxes will come into the city. So there's, we're in that one year period where we have to pay for some of the um, infrastructure in Green Acres, but we're actually not receiving any of the income from Green Acres yet. Uh, so we really don't annex things to get us more money because it doesn't work very well for the first year. Um, so that's where the money comes from. So then how do you break down how you allocate that money inside the general fund? Um, we start out basically with the basic city functions. What do we need to have? You need to have a city attorney, you need to have a finance office, you need to have rec, you need to have um, building and planning. All those are responsibilities of the city that we are required to provide according to state code. That includes fire. Um, one of the things we don't have to provide that we do provide is actually ambulance service. Uh, we are not required by state law to provide that, but since we have combined it with the fire department, we have been able to provide that service um, for quite a while now. Uh, so inside of that, once you know what you have to, to provide, there's also the things you want to provide. Uh, in, those, in this case, that usually falls into the category of things like parks and trails, um, you know, either additional park space or improvements in the park to uh, playground equipment, the splash park, the swimming pool, all those are things that we don't have to provide by state law, but that we want to provide as a city. So then we prioritize those as well. And so as a staff, when we start creating the budget, um, and you can see it if you're following along in the packet on page 20, we actually have the mission, vision, and values of the city. Um, and that's based off of the strategic plan that the commissioners passed. So that's the big picture guidance from the commission as to what our values are. So we look at that, we say, okay, between the things we have, what is it? And then we dig down into the strategic plan itself and the areas that the commission has provided guidance on. So um, an example would be uh, preservation of open space. That's something that the commission has put in the strategic plan. So when we're looking at things, whether it's to do a capital project or whether it's to look to expand park land or to use some of the land that we have in a better way, um, that is one of the things that we would look at. We would look at um, that the commission has said it's a priority to uh, preserve open space. Um, the commission has also provided guidance in a, in a lot of other areas, uh, whether that's how we look at uh, staffing the city, how we look at compensating employees, um, how we uh, look at uh, the reserve for the general fund. So that's a topic that will probably come up quite a bit as we talk through things is the reserve for the general fund. Um, the easiest way to think about it is basically what is the cash balance at the end of the year. That's not exactly right and Paige is probably going to give me the stink eye for saying it that way, but the easiest way to think about it is what is left in funds after you've spent all your budgeted funds. We call it the operational reserve because the best practice is to maintain a minimum of 16.67 reserve. Why 16.67? Um, that basically means two months. So it's two months of operational costs. What's an operational cost? It's not a capital project, so it's not something you're going to build or something new, but it is things like salary, uh, payroll, um, uh, you know, if you're talking the fire department or law enforcement, it's fuel for the vehicles, uh, things that you would actually need to operate on a daily basis uh, to continue as you move forward. So that is what we consider the operational reserve. So that is, um, Best practice sets that at 16.67. Our strategic plan has set that at 33%. Um, you may ask, why is that important? Well, in general, the general fund runs in arrears. Uh, we start the new budget year. We started our new budget year this year, FY21, started July 1st, but we won't receive the tax payments for that until November or December. So without a reserve, the 
the general fund would be out of money day one when we started operations in the new fiscal year. In general, that money is floated by other funds. So if there's extra cash in water or sewer or streets, we use that cash to float the general fund until the tax payment comes in. That's not a great position to be in. Um, obviously, it's tentative. If you run out of money in the other funds, then you won't be able to make payroll. Uh, but more importantly, it's nice for the general fund to be able to carry at least its own way as well as we can. I mean, to really do that 100%, you'd have to have a 50% reserve because basically you go through almost half the fiscal year before you get a tax payment. Um, but we don't, we're not looking to get that far, uh, that, that great of a, a reserve. I think that's actually the state law limit. You can't have more than 50% reserve. Uh, but 33% gives us basically four months worth that, that the general fund can pay for itself before it has to basically borrow money from other funds to continue operating through the first tax payment. So when we're talking operational reserve, that's the, that's the purpose of it. And that's what it means. But basically it's just the cash you have left over. So when you look at budgeting, you look at two things. You look at the, um, how you're spending for the year, like the budget for that year, and then your overall reserve as we move on. So the actual operational reserve itself carries from year to year. If you had that amount of money at the end of fiscal year 20, then that's the amount of money you start fiscal year 21 with. And as long as you budget within your um, revenues, you will maintain that reserve. But if you deficit spend in any fiscal year, meaning you spend more than you're bringing in in revenues, then you eat into that reserve. So anytime you spend more than you bring in money, you're gonna reduce the reserve and that will continue to go down. Which is why if you plan to do that, it's usually a short-term project and it's usually a capital project because there's not a, a recurring cost with that. So you wouldn't want a deficit um, budget for personnel because that's a recurring cost that happens year after year after year. And if you're deficit budgeting year after year after year, pretty soon your reserve will end up at zero. Um, that actually was a path we were on with ambulance until the last mill levy. Um, they were spending more than they were bringing in every year and the reserve had been depleted, actually getting fairly low um, until the mill levy was passed. So we don't want to get in that same kind of situation in the general fund. So you look at what are your projected revenues? Now it's not a science because the state doesn't tell you what you're going to get in taxes um, until pretty late in the fiscal year. So you estimate what you're going to get in revenues um, from all your sources. You look at things like uh, building permits, uh, how much you bring in for that on an annual basis. You look at historical trends, you look at trends in housing and you say, okay, we estimate that we're gonna bring in this much from building permits. You build all that into the budget and then you try to balance it as much as possible. We have run, um, we have not run a deficit budget yet. This year we actually are budgeted to, to have a slight deficit. Um, it's not very significant. I think it's like $20,000 or something. Um, and that's mainly for some capital projects that we're going to put in that we know are a one-time expense that we shouldn't have in uh, out years. So that's kind of the, the philosophy you look at as you go forward. Um, and then, so what does it look like when you actually do it? If you flip to page 28 in the agenda or page 18 in the budget, it'll give you the general summary for basically the last uh, three fiscal years, the two that are just finished and then the one that we are budgeting for currently. Um, but there's also another column in there that is FY20 projected. Uh, and the difference between the FY20 budget and the FY20 projected is the difference between what we thought we were going to spend and what we actually spent. Um, so you can see that in some of the budgeted areas, we did pretty good. In some of the budget areas, we exceeded what we thought we were going to exp uh, expend. Um, and we exceeded what we thought we were going to get in revenues as well in some of the places. So that's good. Um, as you go through that, that's the difference between the budget and the projected, which is why you always want to try and budget somewhat conservatively because there's always unknown costs or unexpected costs that come up during a budget year. Uh, you can't assume that once you set the budget, no new cost will come up. So you try and, and, and have at least a little bit of a cushion. You try to budget conservatively. You try not to over project what you're going to bring in in fines or building permits or even what you're going to get in new um, new property taxes from additional additional funds. Uh, this is one of my favorite pages in the in the budget that Paige has created. It's uh, really intuitive to look at and see where the money in the general fund is going, uh, both either in 
uh, function or in um, by expenditure. So if you look at expenditures by function, you can see general government versus public safety versus public works versus public health, uh, culture and recreation, debt service, miscellaneous, and then other financing uses. Um, one of the big costs, you might see that other financing uses is a significant amount of money. That's where we uh, account for the cost of dispatch because we split that with the county. So it is in its own, um, we have to pay for it out of our general fund. We pay for half the cost, the county pays for half the cost. So that's the significant amount of money you see there is actually for our dispatch services. Um, other than that, you can then see in general where our money goes. Up above that, if you look at the expenditures by type, um, you can see that in general, personnel and benefits account for the significant majority of the general fund. Most of the general fund um, cost is in city staff because it's administration and administration is staff heavy. It's also because it's where police and fire fall and because those are 24 hour services where you have people holding shift work, it's also cost heavy in, in personnel. So 4.3 million in personnel and benefits and about 1.1 in operations. You can see we're only spending 342,000 in capital and then 515,000 in other, other um, uses. Again, that includes the dispatch. So that's a breakdown of the general fund, um, kind of a big overview of, of what the money looks like. The general fund is almost always constrained by personnel costs. And that comes down to having the correct number of personnel to fulfill the city functions, whether that's um, the right number of people in the roaming crew to, to mow the parks, um, you know, the, uh, the ladies at the finance office who are accepting payments for water and sewer and solid waste, um, in the city attorney's office, all those costs are in there, most of them are personnel. There's not heavy in operational costs. Most operational costs in the general fund are gonna be fuel for fire and police, um, office supplies, computers, those kind of things is where some of the more operating costs are gonna come. Um, the other thing you have to look at, uh, if you look on page 119, uh, that's just a list of current debts that the city is holding. So you also wanna look at your debt and your debt capacity uh, before you think about extending any further debt. Um, obviously you can borrow for capital project, whether that's in the general fund or not. Um, but those are areas that we would look at uh, as we look at some of the larger capital projects. And then, um, so that's what we do. And then if you go to page 125 in the agenda, it's the middle of our calendar for our budget year. Um, I pick 125 because that's actually where we start our next budget cycle. Um, from now until the end of the year, we'll close out this fiscal year. We'll look at making sure that the mill levy for the taxes is set properly, that we did, uh, that we've, we were on our projections for last fiscal year, that we don't need to make any big adjustments to the beginning of this fiscal year. But come January 1st, we start the cycle all over again. Um, so we will actually start developing the budget to be adopted for next July 1st on January 1st. So the budget cycle starts at least six months prior. Um, there may be a month or two out of the year that we're not working on the budget, but probably not. We're probably working on something related to the budget 12 months a year. Uh, so the budget process is long, it's arduous. Um, it's not very forgiving as far as numbers go, but uh, there are a lot of, of chances for people to give input through the process, um, whether that's initially through um, interacting with the commission and making changes to the strategic plan um, the strategic plan seems, I don't know, sometimes it may seem intimidating, but it's not. It's not something that can only be looked at once a year. It's not something that can't be changed. Anytime the commission wants to change their priorities, they can do so in the strategic plan. Depending where we are in the budget cycle, it may be harder or easier to incorporate them into the coming budget or the current budget, depending on what you're looking to do. But that is the easiest way for the staff to know what the priorities of the commission is and the commission should be representing the priorities of the community. So that's the easiest way for community priorities to be included in the budgeting process because it's a document that we're gonna look at as we de develop it from, from the very beginning because that's always there. And it's also a document that we update so that the public can follow how we've made progress on those items that people are looking for. So that is 
by far the easiest, mainly because it gives uh, me as a city manager a um, an actual cohesive guidance from the commission as a whole, right? Like I don't have to worry that if um, one commissioner wants this, another commissioner doesn't because they voted on it and put it in the strategic plan. I know I can push forward and that's the goal I'm, I'm looking to reach. So using the reserve that we talked about as an example, I know that the commission has instructed me to get to a 33% reserve. So that's the goal that I try to reach. If they decided that's the wrong number and they wanted to change it to uh, 48 or 27 or any number they wanted really, um, they could do that. And then we would adjust our spending to target that operational reserve instead of through 33% that they've set. And that's just an example of how it would work across the board for um, really any of the items that people are looking for. Uh, and it's a great check as well, because if we bring up an item that doesn't fit into any of our current strategies under the strategic plan, that's a prompt for us to look at our strategies and say, okay, do we need to come up with an additional strategy and what would be um, the tasks under that strategy to achieve it? So. It makes it really easy for us as we develop the budget. I think it makes it easy for the commission to track because they can look through it and see what uh, progress we've made. Um, we try to update it as much as possible. Obviously it's not gonna be up to the minute, but we try to update it every month or so um, because it's usually pretty big items. So that's kind of how, um, so that's the early stages of budget development. Then the staff will go through, um, department heads will bring their requested budgets to me. We'll pare those down. We'll compare them against each other. We'll say, yes, we can do this this year in this department, but no, you can't have that. Um, or we need to cut this across all the departments, or we need to add this to all the departments, whatever it is we need to be doing. Um, and then once we kind of have that put together and have an idea of what a balanced budget would look like, then we start scheduling the, the budget work sessions with the commission. So we have our priorities. We know what we need from an administrative point of view. We put those into a draft budget and then we bring it before the commission and they can look at it and say, yes, this meets our intent. No, it doesn't meet our intent. Um, and then if they need changes, then as a group, they tell us what the changes they want. And then we go back and redo those. We can have as many or as few work sessions as the commission wants. Um, we usually split it out at least into general fund and other funds um, because the general fund is usually the most, um, probably where we can do the most uh, changes, do the, as many changes as anywhere else. Really the cost of, of running the, the water system or the sewer system is pretty set. It really is just a matter of capital at that point. Uh, and then we can set rates to adjust if we need additional funding. Um, the general fund, you pretty much get what you get and then you have to distribute it through all the, all the, different, um, all the different departments. So that being said, the actual general fund line items in the packet that you have should be on page 139. Um, it goes through all the revenue sources, the licensing, um, the intergovernmental uh, charges for service that we do uh, within the general fund. Again, not a significant amount of money. Some of it, most of the uh, largest amounts come in either through building permits or through rec programs, uh, such as a swimming pool or a basketball league. Um, and then starting on page, um, where am I at? Starting page 141 are our expenditures. So can you, please, can you please name the budget page and the agenda page? Cause it's difficult to go back and forth between them. Okay, so the agenda page for this is 141 and the budget page is A3. So it's in the appendix page three. Um, and that's just the first page of expenditures. So it starts with uh, the city commission, it has a city judge, city manager, uh, goes into the finance department, uh, any money we're going to spend on elections, uh, the planner, the city attorney, um, administrative services. So administrative services for us include uh, both the civic center, the swimming pool, and um, our HR services. Um, and we have some administration associated with that as well. Uh, there's the facilities admin. So any um, work we're going to do on the buildings, whether that's replacing a window, adding a door, fixing the steps. Um, and also our cost share for what it takes to maintain the city county building will be in there. Um, we have some central communications budgeted, which is um, like our internet service, uh, the website for the city, some of the phones, those all fall under not any particular um, department, but we use those as a centrally budgeted for the entire city because it's basically one contract for everyone. Same thing with some central stores. We 
we centrally purchase some supplies for the city because it's cheaper, things like paper, um, uh, which we buy by the pallet, uh, things like that. Um, we have the sanitarian in there. We cost share the sanitarian with the county. So the sanitar sanitarian is a split, um, uh, split personnel, one, um, one employee. Uh, and then we have law enforcement, which is on page 154, A16, followed by firefighting, um, which includes the reserves, our building inspector, uh, animal control, roaming crew, which includes our cemetery operations, and swimming pool and parks. So that's kind of what's in the general fund. If you want to look at a specific one, if we wanted to use law enforcement as an example, which is again on page 154, which is A16, um, this page basically gives you the line item details. So you can go through and see specifically where the money goes in each one, whether it's capital outlays, firearm supplies, um, the big cost for the um, for law enforcement is fuel. We spend about $20,000 a year on fuel. That can vary greatly. We estimate it as best as we can, but obviously the, the price of gas varies a lot. Um, there's actually a lot of IT costs in law enforcement because of the privacy and security that's needed through their systems, either through their system or to access the state systems um, as far as the criminal justice goes. So there's some IT costs associated with that. Um, we do training costs, uh, travel if people are going um, out for training as well. Uh, liability is a new one there. You can see that on line 510. It's, you'll notice there's a bunch of dashes to the left of it. It's because we used to account for that in a different area. But we move the cost of both liability and vehicle insurance into each section of the budget now so that you can see better where we spent the money. Before, you wouldn't have known we were, we were spending money on uh, liability for the police department, but now you can see that. Uh, and then capital outlays, any, any new purchases we're gonna make. So that's kind of the operating account. And then there's actually the personnel section, which is the one below it, which it covers salaries and wages, overtime, unemployment, workman's comp, social security, health insurance, clothing allowances. Um, but you can take each section of the budget, whether it's rec or fire or um, city manager or city attorney, and go through the line item for each detail. Now that's not gonna tell you exactly what we spend it on. You're not gonna know what um, paper we're buying or what the computer system is that we're funding, but it is, uh, it's pretty detailed and covers most of the things that you can think of. Um, I think that gives you a pretty good overview of how the budget works, both from revenue standpoints, what you can spend money on, um, how the budgets are developed, when they're developed, uh, and what it looks like once it makes it into the budget book for you to review. So I will stop there, hopefully, and wait any questions. So I think one of the main things we need from the commissioners is questions on what you'd like Michael to clarify or some of the for him to address some of the issues that we have talked about in the past and why we're having this special budget meeting. Um, but I do know one of the main questions that has been brought to us is how do we potentially budget for some of these um, priorities that have been brought to the city from the commission? What are some possible funding sources? Are in this budget because we are at the late end or the late stages of the budget um, planning that what is the likelihood or where would the funding come from when it comes to adding in priorities to our budget? What are some options, I guess? Chair Hoagland, can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm concerned about process because it looks like we're jumping into the action items and we went over, according to the agenda, we were supposed to do a roll, roll call and public comment period first. And it looks like we're on action item A, the city manager's bu budget recommendations. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at, the, at this agenda. Here's my screen share. It looks like we were supposed to have a public comment period first. Yeah, and we, 
we have public comment. I think we need questions clarified from the commission. Okay. Um, and then public comments will come in to that as well. We'll open it to public comment in a minute. Um, but are there any, in, in, I think that because before we start talking about the, the priorities or the wishes of the community, I'd like to understand also what the process is to adding and taking away. So this is before public comment, and I feel like it's um, at the correct place. So Michael, could you uh, answer that question for us? Sure, so we're at the final stages of the budget right now. Um, obviously we started back in January. Uh, we pretty much solidified as, as far as revenue sources, so there's not really much we can do as far as expecting additional revenue. Uh, so we're really only looking at the expenditure side. Uh, at this point, there's really, um, if you wanna add uh, priorities to the budget, there's only two places money can come from to fund those, uh, either out of the reserve or we cut something else and use that funding for uh, the new priority. Uh, those are really the only two options and actually those are really the only two options through almost the entire budget process, but especially now uh, with the requirement to have this, this to the state um, by September 3rd, we're pretty much down to just being able to um, either just take it out of the reserve and having less money at the end of FY21 or finding something to cut and replacing it with a new priority. Okay, thank you. Other commissioner con or questions? before we move to our next steps. <clears throat> Can, and also uh, Faith, if possible, could you put on the screen our agenda so we all can see it? Um, and I appreciate that you've been bringing up the sections as we've talked through them, which really helps the public to understand what we're looking at. Um, but could you bring the agenda up so that the public notice or the agenda. Okay. I just wanted everyone to see that and I needed to take a quick look. I can't go back and forth while leading as easily either. Um, so commissioners, what other questions do you have in relationship to the priorities? or in relationship to any of the budget, if you have any. Commissioner Schwartz here. All right, go ahead. Um, with regard to law enforcement, have we um, budgeted for body cameras? And if so, um, does that impact our insurance with MMIA? Do we, with body cameras, do perhaps we get a discount on our on our insurance or anything like that. Michael, I guess, I'm asking. Uh, as far as uh, body cameras go, we have not budgeted for them in this fiscal year. Uh, that is one of the areas we're looking at, at possibly using CARES Act funding uh, to be able to do a capital purchase that we wouldn't usually be able to do. Uh, we do have money budgeted in for our car cameras. So the officers have um, cameras in each vehicle and they have a, a microphone that they wear on themselves that, is, uh, that goes back to the car over a certain amount of feet and I'm not sure what that is, uh, but they do are able to record voice uh, when they're out of their vehicle, even if the camera's not on them. So that's our current system. We're looking at, at um, expanding that system, basically using the same provider to um, provide a body cam solution that would be able to do both the car and the body cam at the same time. Um, so that's something we're, we're looking at and hopefully we'll be able to fund this year with some um, what we'd like to call unexpected revenue, things that we don't ex uh, have it budgeted for as far as revenue goes. Uh, MMIA does not give a discount uh, for body cameras, so we can't save any money as far as on our liability insurance. Um, but it, body cameras are one of those things I think that will uh, add to transparency and protect both the uh, community and the officers. Thank you, Michael. Okay, um, I just want to make sure everyone has any of the basic questions out because I think one of the things 
that we we need is the information before the public also feels like they know the questions to ask. So I want to make sure everyone feels like their questions are out there. The comments from the city manager um, are all clear as far as our budget process and, and um, the steps we take each year to get to where we are. Um, so any last things before public comment? Okay, um, you should put your name in the chat. That should be the only thing going in chat, in chat is your name. Um, and then we will call, I don't see anyone yet. We will call um, you went in as we line up and then please state your name and address. Do we have any public comment? You're also welcome to, if you are struggling with getting through to the chat or chatting, please do just try to raise your hand and wait. Hello. Chair Hogan, Chair Hogan, can I get clarification quick before you take public comment? Yes, go ahead. Can you give some instruction to people who are on the phone? Because that's one thing I've heard feedback on is there's no way to raise your hand or chat in a chat box if you dialed in on your phone. How you want those people to join if they have public comment? I think that's what I just stated right after. I know some people struggle with chat. So if you can't put in, you know, into the chat your name, try to get our attention. I'll call on you then as the, you're lined up. I know that it might be interrupting, but sometimes that happens, especially because we don't all have um, great phones for for uh, Zooming. So that we have to be accommodating to tech, tech issues. So I do see already that I have Jonathan. So Jonathan, go ahead, state your name and address. Jonathan Hedinger, uh, 519 West Park Street. So. I wanted to um, thank you for having another budget hearing and um, discussing some of these issues. And then also just comment that we I'd still would really like to see a police community forum um, in the coming weeks. Um, and many communities across the state have been able to have these and it would be great to have that, especially when we're discussing funding for some of these issues. Um, I wanted to talk about a few different um, items that I think have been brought up that I think would be pretty important um, in the coming months and for your consideration. Um, one of the first items is um, a social worker position within the police department. I think that um, that would really benefit the police department. I know that, um, that from working at the enterprise and from being on emails and things like that, that there's nonviolent or repeat calls from nonviolent members of our community that police and even commissioners sometimes have to spend hours and hours responding to. And I think that a social worker could help better address these issues than something like um, just calling the police whenever there's an issue. Um, a social worker could follow up on uh, these issues and help free up time for officers to do their work. Um, we know that Park County has among the highest suicide rates of the nation and social services cuts in the past few years have left many of our most vulnerable struggling even more. Um, and it'd just be great if we could have a social worker responding to some of these issues because we don't always need to, a gun to solve the problems in our community. I also wanted to talk about a housing action plan. Um, I think that, I know that the city has, is thinking a lot about housing. Earlier this year, you discussed the potential of paying for housing for uh, for city employees because it's really hard to find housing here and it's even got, it's gotten even more so during COVID. And I think that um, a good way to build on the growth policy update um, and all the progress we're making there would be to follow up with the housing action plan. Um, I think that would be a, a more comprehensive look would benefit um, more than one-off developments of 10, un 10 housing units here or there and could help 
drive sustainable solutions for years to come. And then I also think that it's important to, um, to help fund the warming center. Um, I think that especially during COVID when they have a lot of unexpected expenses, such as putting people in hotel rooms rather than staying open, that is an important place to look. Um, and so I wanted to bring up a few ideas for how these could be funded. Um, I know that this year the city is budgeted to spend $25,750 on travel, lodging, and meals for employees. Um, during the pandemic, I don't really think that there's going to be a lot of conferences held, so maybe we could temporarily suspend that funding to just help out with some of these one-time things. I know that the police budget for cell phones is increasing from $1,500 to $8,400, which seems like a large expense, and I know uh, Chair Hoagland mentioned that before. Um, also, the police have budgeted $53,000 for a new truck for a code enforcement officer. I know there was some confusion about that, but that's what it says on the request um, in the budget. And I think that maybe we could put that on hold or maybe look at a different um, way to fund it. And then the other thing that I wanted to talk about right now was um, the city has a reserve of 30, it wants to have a reserve of 33.3%. Right now there's a 35.9% reserve that's an extra $132,000. Um, and then I also just think that the CARES Act funding so far, it's kind of confusing where that's all gone. And I was thinking that that could potentially fund some of these issues. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm writing a list. If everyone is okay, commissioners, if you're okay with having Michael kind of discuss it after so that we can make sure we have it more succinct it, it, because it could take a lot longer if we address it after each one. What do you guys think? You okay? All right. And so I, I just listed, and if everyone would help me, um, listing some of what uh, the priorities for the community and what they're stating. Okay. So we have next, we have Kathy. Go ahead. Is that me? Well, if it is, I would just like to reiterate everything that was just said. And I appreciate that you're making a list. Uh, Darrell, and um, I think we are in time to shift some focus and uh, maybe rethink a budget going forward for our present time. Um, so I appreciate that you're doing that and we'll answer these issues at the end of this, as long as we're not taking action on some of these more important things and taking budget away from some of the things that the community feels are a new priority before we vote on a budget. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next, I think we have Julie. Um, hi, Julie Eaton at 431 South 5th Street. And I have a question and just a comment. One was, um, I concur with what uh, Jonathan and Kathy have said. Um, my question was, I was looking over, it was going kind of quickly with the city manager, so um, I was noticing the issue of liability insurance, and I was, my question was, I saw it under judicial, I saw it under other categories, and then I didn't see it under police, but I did see it under city manager and um, at a much higher level than the other ones, so as I, my question was, is that encompassing the police liability insurance? Thank you. Well, thank you, Julie. And I put it on the to uh, for Mr. Okay. I hear wind out there somewhere. Next, I think we have Lexi. Go ahead, Lexi. Hi, um, Lexi Folkerts, 223 South 5th Street. 
Um, I want to echo everything Jonathan said. I appreciate that he did all this research and got actual numeric values for a lot of these things that could be surplus or just could be a little extra funding. Um, I just wanted to highlight that when all of us are asking you guys to consider a uh, social worker and those kind of positions to help out the community, I just wanted to highlight that adding that position doesn't mean that we have the exact same police funding. It means that we restructure how we're currently doing things and we rethink how many police officers we need, how many positions we need, and acknowledge that a, a social worker is going to take up a lot of the work that our current staff already does. So it's not a apples and apples, whatever. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is if we're gonna consider body cams at all, I just want to highlight how important it is for the public that that data be available and not, I don't want to see what I've seen in so many other cities where it takes months and months of litigation just to get uh, police footage released um, when something does happen. So, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lexi. We have Sarah, go ahead. Hi, Sarah Stans, 217 South E Street. Um, I wanna thank the commission for holding this budgetary meeting. I think um, a lot of us are kind of catching up with the budget process um, and just because we don't know about the budget um, and, and how it all works. So the repetitive information is, is always really grateful. Um, I just had a couple questions on um, maybe the first being, uh, what is the process for, um, for reviewing the budget when we talk about cutting costs and looking for different funds? So just who is engaged? Is that just sit with the commission or you know, when new priorities come up, um, if that doesn't come from the, um, from the reserve fund? And then my second question is, what is the ideal time and process for committees and boards to get involved in the budget prioritization and decisions? Um, I, I am feeling like I'm always, I'm just coming a little bit late and I know that that requires me probably to attend a lot more meetings. And I'm you know, very happy to do this. I just don't know as a, as a um, <clears throat> committee member, if I'm just supposed to attend the public meetings such as this, or if there's an engagement with commission, or is it all offline, or um, for instance, with parks and trails, you know, when major transportation and infrastructure is being developed and it impacts some of our, our networks and trails, um, at what point do we, are, are we asked to get involved or to comment or how can we help set those priorities um, so that we're not coming at the tail end and, and creating um, delays for finalization of budget. And then regarding um, the importance of transportation networks, including active transportation and what's coming out in the growth policy, I just wanted to know, are there any, um, or who are, are there any dedicated staff or paid members who are, um, um, who are tackling, you know, like the, the trails priority plan or the active transportation plan um, that are both set in the strategic plan and, you know, how do we, how do we move those forward, both from the committee perspective and as well as um, being part of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Bard, you're up next. Hi, uh, Barb Oldershaw, 514 North G Street. And I have a couple comments. Uh, one is wearing my work hat as the program director at the Park County Community Foundation. I wanted to put a plug in for the warming center. And I uh, was on the meeting last week and stuck it out until uh, after 11 when you were finally getting to that topic and unfortunately I had called in on my phone and when you're on your phone there's no way to indicate that you want to um, make a comment if you're just calling in. So anyway, uh, here I am now. Uh, 
we at the Park County Community Foundation believe very strongly in the concept of the warming center. We think it's a very important project, which is why we were one of the funders of the pilot project for the warming center. And additionally, since December, we have been working collaboratively with HRDC to relaunch the Park County Housing Coalition. And based on my work with them, my experience is that they have a really excellent grasp of the continuum of services that is needed to help move people out of crisis. So they're not simply doing the warming center as a and be all end all to the situation, but they're looking more holistically at what their clients need in order to get into more um, consistent, reliable housing. So I think because of the service they provide and the skill with which they provide that, that the warming center is uh, very much uh, I, deserving of um, funding from the city. I think it provides a very important service. And the other comment I wanted to make is now me switching hats and speaking as an individual based on work that I've done in the past on police accountability. There was a question that was raised at the last staff meeting as to what what we were, I'm sorry, the last commission meeting as to what folks were asking for to be different with the police, um, in addition to having oversight or body cameras or whatever. And to me, the biggest thing is just having more clarity as to what, um, what we're asking the police to do that's sort of outside of the domain of police work. and. I think as we have had seen more and more needs from community members and less and less social services being available, then the police kind of become the catch-all response when there's somebody in crisis. And while there may be specific crime and safety needs where you do need a trained police officer, sometimes, as was mentioned earlier, what you need is a social worker what you need is somebody from Child Protective Services. Um, some, you know, that just there's a there's a range of needs to make our community safer and to support the vulnerable members of our community. And sometimes those trying to address those needs with a police officer is not necessarily the appropriate or most effective way to address those needs. Thank you for your time and thank you for scheduling in this additional meeting. Thank you, Barb. Alex, or I'm sorry, Alexis. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, I, actually, Barb sort of made one of my points for me, um, but I'd like to echo it. And I think that that point is, I think what a lot of people are talking about when they're talking about you know, taking a look at the police or taking a look at the police budget is sort of a little bit outside of the scope of the police in that we're sort of worried about how are there ways to like divert people away before they ever even need to interact with the police. So how are there ways to potentially get somebody into a warming center or to send somebody to intervene in a mental health crisis? And so you know, not all of it might necessarily be under the scope of the police department, but I do think it would be a great thing for the city to look at how can we, you know, lessen the burden on the police and, and keep them from having to respond to calls that, you know, aren't really under the scope of their job, but that they've sort of been forced to respond to um, because now they're, they're sort of the department of last resort. Um, and then another thing I have is a question. And that was, um, Mr. Cardos was talking about uh, body cams and potentially paying for things out of like unexpected revenue. Um, and I was just wondering in general, I guess, what is the process for unexpected revenue? Or like, you know, I guess when the city makes more than their projected budget, how do they determine um, where that excess money gets spent? Uh, sort of what is the process for that? So those are my questions, thanks. Thank you, Alexis. Okay, I don't see anyone else in the chat, but is there um, any community members that 
would like to speak? Or I should say any others. Yeah, Patricia Grabo. Go ahead, Patricia. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Jonathan for his comments. I think that's remarkable that he, he spent the time. I, it seems as though um, it should have been the job of the staff, but nonetheless, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, when we lost community health um, services, we lost a huge asset for our community. And it is what's happening to me, I, I think we definitely need a police community forum because it is difficult for people with disabilities to feel safe and especially mental health disabilities and it should not be the job of the police. There is a single thing on those priorities of the city commission that cannot be funded. To me, I don't see, I hear the city manager going, we do this, we do this, we do this, but I don't hear, okay, these are the priorities of the city commission, therefore we will figure out how to do this because it is, it is something the community that has come up from the community, housing has come up from the community, parks and trails have come up from the community, uh, a warming center has come up from the community and the commissioners. Why are we not listening in this budget to the community and our commissioners? It just staggers my mind. The strategic plan is a creation of this commission. It, we had the CIP before, which wasn't very good. And now we, we've got the strategic plan, which I think is just as bad. But why aren't we, why isn't this commission capable, this, capable of saying to the city uh, staff, here's our priorities, let's incorporate it in the budget, let's figure out how. I didn't hear that with the city manager's comments. And I think, it, I think it, the public has been very creative in trying to figure out how to make this work. So I, I think that it, things are a uh, police community forum is terribly important. We are brutal with our mental health people in this community. We have lawsuits pending. The city will save all kinds of money if it just looks forward to takes into consideration what is going on in the community and responds. We are also in the middle of COVID where we've lost half of our workforce. And this budget reflects nothing of that. I, I, I cannot reiterate enough how to say to this commission, it's been your job. You did a great job. You figured out priorities. We're so grateful that you did. Now it's up to the staff to implement them. It, it, gratefully, the community is much more creative on how to find that money than the staff right now but it should be, we should find that money. It's the priority of the city commission. Thank you for listening to the community. Thank you, Patricia. I think next we have Cheryl. Go ahead. Cheryl, are you there somewhere? I'm assuming she's having to look for her, but I'm assuming she has, oh, there she is. I think she just got connected to audio or she's trying. Well, I'm going to open it to anyone else at any other public comment, and I will keep it for Cheryl at, for next if there's someone else. I think she's struggling to get. to get on and I don't want her to not have this opportunity. Hey Darrell, at this point, can you just remind people that if they're not 
discuss any discussing anything, please mute their microphones. I know uh, several people um, are active and not muted, and it just makes the feed so much better if they mute. Uh, Mel, you especially. Um, yes, just a reminder from, I think you got that, Quentin. You explained it well. I don't think I have to again, but Quentin, listen to what Kit, Quentin said. Oh, muting, please. It's probably me a little bit, I'm going to be honest, there because go. there's people in my house. No, and you've I, been great. Okay, I can't get rid of them. Um. So Cheryl, are you able to get on? I think what I'm going to do then, we'll wait for Cheryl and we'll let her um, get on when she can. But I think it sounds like there are no other public comments at this time. And so this, we are gonna close public comments. So I wanna make sure everyone's done except for Cheryl. She gets to try, get back on. Um, but, I think there was quite a few questions. I know I had, there was one point or question that I missed from Alexis. So at some point I want to make sure it was the last one and I didn't get it written down quickly enough. Um, but I think there's some clarification that uh, I think the commission and the public would like on a couple issues. Okay, just at least to start with. And that is like the liability insurance and understanding the process of what liability insurance um, like increases. I know we talk about them all the time within increases and what each year, how it increases or um, it never seems to decrease. I can tell you that. That was one question to start um, with. And then the process, uh, one of the community members talked about or asked about process and I think it was Sarah and she had asked about when the public can be um, part of the process or engaged in the process. So all public or all budget meetings are public. They are um, posted and we, we discuss them during commission meetings that, you know, and plan them and schedule. And then we, we um, meet a number of how many, it depends on how big and long it takes. We'll meet anywhere from three to four meetings, usually to discuss the budget before then we move it to a resolution or a public hearing and a resolution. So it, there's usually, there's multiple times to be engaged in the, bu the budget process. Um, Michael, is that, and or other commissioners, are there any other things I missed on that? On the process? Well, I think uh, Sarah was also looking for a, a definite contact point for uh, hard information as far as uh, where she could make her thoughts known. Uh, in terms of a contact point at the city? For budget, like getting community priorities to the city. Okay, Michael, can you answer that question? Thank you, Warren, for helping clarify. Sure. Uh, I think, so let me cover the liability insurance one real quick, because I think that one's easy. Um, Anything that you, where you see the liability, because there's a question about where it appears, it appears under each department. So if there's a section under city manager, that's liability insurance for the city manager. There's a separate section under law enforcement, under fire. Uh, all those are based off of salaries and um, they're not new or increased this year. They're just accounted for in a different place. We used to account for them all in a central fund. So you wouldn't have seen them looking at the general fund, but that's why there's dashes to the left of them uh, for previous years because we didn't account for them in those funds. They aren't a new expense, it's just new in how we look at them to try and make it a more complete picture when you look at each department. So that's the liability insurance under any department is only for that department. Um, so that's how that works. As far as input into the process, 
there's a there's a lot of ways to get input into the process. Uh, I would recommend the committees and the boards. Um, you take uh, Parks and Trails as an example. Uh, if you go to the Parks and Trails meeting and you know and you make your priorities known to the Parks and Trails board, um, they should also go through a process where they set their priorities as the Parks and Trails board. And then those priorities are given to the city staff and that's what we use when we start developing um, the, the city budget. So if you look at the Parks and Trails agenda, I think their next meeting is on the 17th and that is exactly what they're working on. They're working on setting their, their priorities. So once they do those, those will go up to the commission for approval. And then once those are approved at the commission level, um, they'll either get incorporated into the strategic plan or they'll just be given to staff to um, incorporate into the budget as we are able. Um, I think someone asked if there's a specific person to talk to in the city staff or if there's somebody specifically assigned to that. Uh, there's not, we don't have a true parks department uh, as some larger municipalities do. So really it's covered through public works and rec are probably the two biggest points of contact and then um, my office as well. So those are the three areas that work on it the most. Um, parks, uh, public works from a maintenance perspective since they run the roaming crew uh, for maintenance of the parks and installation of any park features or building any trails or overseeing contractors that build trails. And then the rec department from a use perspective as far as renting out the gazebos or uh, issues like that. So. Um, that's the way to get, that's one way to get involved in the process is to attend specific board meetings. Um, another way to get involved in the process is just to make your priorities known to the commissioners who will make them part of the strategic plan. Uh, so if you see a strategic plan meeting uh, on the agenda, that's a great time to come and make your, um, your priorities known to the commissioners and then they can incorporate those into the strategic plan, which is then available for the staff as we develop the budget from that point on. So that's another easy way to um, get priorities into the budget process, um, as well as any time you just want to provide input to the city, either through Faith or through my office or through any department, uh, just those emails sent on. Um, we take all those emails as individual inputs, and then if there's a consensus or there's a significant issue that a lot of people are interested in, then that will get folded into um, our priorities as we go forward. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioners, any thoughts on that or any um, additions to that? Okay, as far as other questions, so I'm just trying to get the basic questions that were asked that are more the informational before we move into priority-based um, statements and questions. Um, let's see. Any the other that I missed. I feel like there was one more, but um, yeah, was go, ahead. Well, go ahead. Um, you know, one question that um, I think people have been wanting to ask but haven't asked is, uh, you know, staffing at the police level as far as the number of officers that this city requires with our demographics and our population. Um, are we I'm sure we're not overstaffed, but um, if, if Chief Johnson or uh, Michael could uh, um, maybe just fill us in a little bit, because uh, people are talking about perhaps replacing a police officer with a social worker. Um, what does that look like um, as far as um, providing you know, safety and um, stuff in our community? Thank you. So, Quentin, do you want, would you like that? Because that will start another part of this conversation. Um, yeah, I'm you, sorry. I just, uh, but it's. Uh, do you want us to start that, I guess? Or people ready? want to ask and have it asked. So and there was uh, statements and questions, in particular statements uh, about priorities that the community feels towards right. funding. And that's one of them, especially the police funding or police uh, how we fund the police, where what the money is used for, how the community feels about um, its allocation towards uh, potentially down the road or soon, I guess, uh, for a social worker. So are we ready to jump into some of these priorities? Melissa, do you want to go? There was the last question that Alexis had, I think was the last question 
specifically budget related from the public and that was she was asking what the process is for spending the excess revenue that Michael mentioned when excess rev revenue comes along who how what's that process look like and who's making those decisions and how thank you for catching that Michael can you talk about process of um, the excess revenue and what we Sure, uh, I, I, I would refer to it usually as unexpected revenue um, because it, it's not necessarily in excess. It just depends on how the budget was looking that year. Uh, if, there's, um, if there's also unexpected expenditures. So it really comes down to how has a budget year gone? If we receive unexpected revenues, but there were also unexpected expenditures, they balance each other out and there really isn't a, um, there isn't a need to make any decisions because the money got used um, through also unexpected costs. If there is um, unexpected revenue that isn't used, then if we want to use that, we would have to go through the budget amendment process. So if nothing's done, it just gets added to the, the reserves. Um, if we want to exceed the budget authority that the commission gave us in the, the budget itself, whether the staff wants to do that or the commission wants to do that, then we would have to bring that in front of the commission for a budget amendment. Um, and then we would go through that process at that time. So we would say, hey, either the staff wants to spend this on this because we think it's an opportunity to maybe get a capital project done that we haven't been able to fund. Or if the commission says, hey, we'd like this priority funded with this unexpected revenue. Either way, it's got to go in front of the commission so that there can be a public uh, discussion about the use of that money. If it's ex exceeding um, the, the budget authority that we passed at the beginning of the year. Does that answer the question? Sort of. Commissioners, do you think that answers it clearly enough? Any questions off of um, how, when we have not excess, but uh, additional funds, what we do? Any questions on that? Okay. I'm wondering if our last. If Cheryl did, is Cheryl available? I just want to make sure we give her that chance. I see she's there, but she's unable to speak for some reason. I'm here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. State your name, Thank Annette. You. Oh, I didn't have any comment or anything. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. That was easy. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, moving back then to, we're going to switch. Darrell, if community comment is still open, I'd like to uh, remind uh, this meeting of uh, something from the last meeting. Is it still open? Um, technically, your time was up, Kathy. Uh, can we we've got to move forward and we have to go through process so it, it's about staying you know within that realm of process and okay. so i apologize um if it's just well and i apologize i'm not sure if my subject is regarding this budget in particular i will just say it's about uh commissioner newt's Okay, well, I think then maybe um, we should, I think we'll have to address that in some other format. Okay. okay. All right, we're gonna move on. So we have quite a few things on our list to discuss and we're talking about priorities. Um, the community and the commission have stated some, some of their priorities and how how can we possibly move forward with with adding these priorities into this budget if that's possible um i think is one of our main questions sometimes it's possible and sometimes i mean there's time that goes into planning for all things and especially in government takes a while so and 
And then also I want to make sure that we're addressing what the commissioners need to state about the priorities and that what they've received from community and comments from the community. Um, so I think our next steps is I, I would love for us to maybe kind of pick through some of these uh, priorities that were brought up by not just the community, but it's also been by, from the commission in the past. And so do you guys all think commissioners that that would be the best process for moving to our next steps? Uh, Chair Hoagland, before you go on, would you like to take a five minute break at the hour and a half point? Oh yes. Well, we're at almost an hour and a half, so I think that's a good idea because we're moving into the other priorities that have been stated. Um, and then we'll move after our break. We will start on priorities and discussing and answering some of the questions that were brought up in relationship to the priorities. Is that fair, everyone? You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have five minutes. We're a little right. early. We'll take it now since we're step we're changing. Uh, the priority points that have been brought up by the commission and the community. I would love for first the commissioners, if there's anything that you want to bring up and state before we go through this list, um, I would love to hear it now. I'll say what? something. Yeah. All right. I think just generally speaking, it's really important. It's been brought up by the community, but I think it's really important to recognize that this is not a typical year. And that, so while we go off the strategic plan and while we, under a perfect scenario, set priorities in an ideal way, this year was radically different because we weren't even able to finalize the strategic plan because of COVID. And then COVID has really exposed some of the gaps in our community where services and needs aren't being met. So I think that's really important as we think about priorities is that just really recognizing that the culture has shifted, things have shifted radically in the last six months. Thanks for that. Uh, clarification. Very good point, Melissa. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to, you know, the budget, you know, is not, you know, set in stone right now, but this late stage of the game, I think we're looking at using CARES Act funds to, you know, perhaps, um, you know, prioritize some things, especially like the warming center, you know, can we at least, you know, give them some kind of funding or something out of our CARES Act money and, uh, you know, shift those priorities around. Um, um, you know, changing the uh, staffing to the police department and stuff like that uh, right now, um, I don't see how that's possible. Um, we're at the, uh, at that point where we need to pass this budget by September 3rd, whatever. And, uh, uh, but we need the conversation going forward and we need the public to know when we, uh, um, when's the, you know, proper time to start talking about the things for the next budget year. It's like Michael says, we start talking about it, you know, after the first of the year and uh, how we engage the public in that, you know, to get, you know, more input as we're looking at it as the commission and stuff like that and prioritizing things. Um, that would be great, but, um, you know, a lot of these things should be answered by the state too, you know, our loss of services and stuff like that, um, is due to our legislature, you know, um, 
you know, defunding, um, you know, so, social services in this community. So um, we can we can only do so much, but and I think we're doing a great job. And I've never seen the community involved as much in the budget process um, up until this point. And uh, I think it's great. And I think it's great that we're um, being transparent and, and helping people know exactly how the budget process works. Thanks. I just want to clarify that. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Quentin. Um, any other commissioner comments before we move on to some of the priorities that have been brought up? Nothing? I feel like I talk more than anyone else in these meetings nowadays. Um, I think that, I think it's Zoom. Uh, let's talk, so here are some of the priorities. I'm just gonna list them and I think we've been discussing a lot of them on and off for various amounts of time. They've been brought to, to the meetings from the commission, from the community, and I think some of it, I can't promise all, but I know that we have asked our city manager to have um, some information or like answers to the possibility of funding and how we go about that, if it's possible, what are some options, what are some steps? And so according to my list, we have a couple questions or priorities that have been brought up and I know the commissioners have more to add. So we've talked about, um, or there's been questions about like, the funding that Jonathan brought up with the like, cell phone and the increase, uh, the new truck and travel. Those are some questions on, is this the best use of our funding? And sometimes we need information behind it as to why it's funded the way it is. And we've kind of been going through that this whole budget process is why do we need this? Why don't we? Um, so Michael, could you, and the reserve, I think that those are all already budgeted. Can, can we, in the reserve we've addressed some, um, but could you address those uh, questions and or like I guess it's shifting potentially shifting funding from them I think is what our community members were asking and I think we need to talk about why they're in the budget and initially and start with that Michael that's you thank you madam chair so um, of the three um, Let's talk about the truck first. So the truck is not a truck. Uh, the code enforcement truck is purchased. It's already done last fiscal year. It's sitting out in the parking lot. I saw it on the way in. It looks nice. Um, the What is budgeted, if you look on page 154 of the agenda or A16 of the, of the budget itself, if you look under line 976, which is the very last line under operating account, you'll see vehicles and you'll see it's budgeted for 20,000. So that's the entire budget in the general fund for vehicles. Um, in that case, this year, that's a replacement for a police cruiser. Um, that's a 2013 Taurus, I think, with somewhere over 100,000 miles on it. Um, it is $20,000, even though you know in the, the CIP or in the, the capital request form, it says 53,000, because we don't spend just general fund monies on it. Um, we're spending 20,000 out of the general fund the rest of that, the $33,000, we are spending with police impact fees. So that is monies that we collect from um, developers or someone building anything new. As they build new homes, they pay the impact fees. They're meant to increase our capacity or maintain our capacity um, as their share of um, beginning to get services from the city. So we've budgeted $33,000 out of impact fees for that replacement cruiser and $20,000 out of the general fund for this year. So if you cut that vehicle, you'd save $20,000 in the general fund that would be available for um, 
general use. The other 33,000 is specifically peace police impact fees, so it can't be spent any other way. It has to be spent to increase the capacity of law enforcement. Um, but it's not actually going to save you any money because next year we're just going to have to budget for two vehicles to replace because we replace on average about a vehicle a year. So it's a capital cost, but it's a replacement cost. Um, you can ship it to next year. We'll just you pay a little more in repairs this year. Uh, and then we would have to budget for two replacements next year, or you could push it again and then we could budget for three replacements the following year. Uh, it's just really a vehicle replacement plan that keeps us from spending too much on um, repairs and keeps us with good vehicles for the officers to drive. So that covers the truck issue um, because it's not a truck, it's actually a, a new Dodge Caravan, I believe. No, Dodge Durango is the new one we can bring it in. Um, the cell phones, um, that's kind of a combination of different things. We've increased the cell phone stipend for police officers because we are ceasing to uh, issue city cell phones, um, which would have occurred in a different part of the budget. And pretty much everyone now has their own cell phone. And we found this is an easier way to maintain them. Um, we don't have to pay to upgrade them. We don't have to pay to maintain them. We don't have to do any, if they're lost or broken or stolen, it's not in the city's pocket uh, because we're paying stipends for this. So it's an increase in the budget, but it's actually a way to save some funds and to actually uh, support the guys in, in having the phone that they're used to and comfortable with. So when they need it in emergencies, um, it's easy for them to use. So that's why the cell phone looks different this year is because we changed the way we issue those and use those um, in the police department. Uh, as far as travel goes, that might be an area we would save money. That could be an area we underspend. Um, unfortunately, we don't know yet. A lot of that uh, travel expense is either for uh, new officers to go to the academy, which is a large expense, or uh, firefighters to go to the National Fire Academy uh, for training out there. So this is all the training, uh, training dollars that we actually hope we get to spend because it's good for the guys and it's good for the departments to have that training. Um, so yeah, we may underspend that. I I'm hope we don't. I hope that next spring that the travel has picked back up. Because again, this travel lasts all the way through one July. Um, uh, and we still actually are attending some um, training because it's not available locally and it's, and it's required to do. Um, whether that's for uh, continuing education for the city attorney or for the finance director, uh, there's a lot of different travel that has to take place. Uh, because we can't do it online or can't do it locally. Uh, if we do underspend, that could be a place that we have some additional monies next year uh, in the reserve. Um, so those are kind of the, the issues we're looking at as far as those three items are concerned in the budget. Uh, as far as the, the operational reserve goes, uh, Jonathan's absolutely correct. It's at 35% right now, not because it was budgeted that way or because we were super good at spending money this year. But if you look on page, 237 of the packet, uh, you'll see that we received um, uh, 329,000, just a little over, uh, in CARES Act reimbursements right at the end of the fiscal year. So that money came in and went directly into the reserve because we didn't have time to spend it on anything else. So that uh, is a piece of good fortune. That's some extra money that we have that was not budgeted last year and uh, currently isn't budgeted this year because it came in well after the budget process was done. So there, there is a place where we have some additional um, wiggle room as far as funding goes for the reserve. Great. Commissioners, did I miss anything on that section? I'm just trying to put these into little boxes of information. Um, did I miss anything on that, those questions or comments from the community? Darrell, I don't see that you missed anything, but it is a struggle to try to navigate 250 pages on an iPad and 250 pages in paper. So when we're like, I'm trying to look through the paper copy and the, I'm not finding things as fast because there's no agenda numbers on the budgets. So I'd like to go back through and look at each one of those line items if we can, because I'm not seeing them all because I can't whip through that fast on my end. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Okay. So do you want, how do you want to go about that? I just want to ask questions and have Michael say where he's seen it. Great. Um, or if, you know, we could, since Jonathan asked this question, we could 
because there's one on here I'm not seeing at all. We could ask Jonathan too. So the first thing is the truck. Um, so I'm seeing that on page, let's see, A16 of the budget. And it's the last, it's 976. So it's just, yep, right there. So I see the $20,000. And then when I flip back to the budget on page 42, the capital request forms. Thank you, Paige. So this is page 42 of the budget. So I'm not sure what it is in the agenda packet. I'm sorry. It's page 58 in the agenda packet. Thank you, Paige. So when you look here, right here, the text at the top, project description, it specifically says with the addition of a dedicated code enforcement officer, we need to purchase a dedicated vehicle for that position. So I understand that one, it sounds like the city found a deal and they were able to get one during the 2020 fiscal year or I think that's what I'm understanding based on the last meeting. But this doesn't match what Michael's saying in terms of vehicles. It does match in the numbers, the 20,000 from the general fund and the 33,000 from impact fees. But there's some contradictions between what the budget is saying and what um, I'm hearing about this vehicle. So that's the first item. And then the second thing um, is the cell phones. So I think that's back again on page A16 in the line items. And so I'm sorry, I don't know the agenda packet number. Okay, so there's actually two line items for phones. Um, one, they're both named 347. One is up above under law enforcement and the other one is down below under police officers. And I believe, Jarrell, that this is what you were getting at at a previous work session, is that there's already between six and $7,000 being allocated for cell phones every year. And then, or those, that was the increase. And then down below, it's between 400, if we start at 20, 2019 through 2021, it starts at 410 and goes up to $8,400. So it looks like there's projected $8,400 on that lower line plus another 6,000 on the upper line, which is about $14,400 on phones. Um, can we talk about that? And then the third thing was the travel, lodging, and meals. Can we ask Jonathan what the line items were that he was looking at? Because I had a hard time finding that one. I'm not, that's, that's not jumping out at me. Would that be okay, Darrell? Yes. And, uh, Yes, Michael. Well, it's number 370. Uh, have Jonathan clarify what he was referring to because we were unable to find it. Because he said $25,750 and that number is not jumping off the page for me. I think that's overall travel for everybody, police, fire. But I'll let Michael answer that. Well, I was hoping that Jonathan, can Jonathan, can we ask Jonathan first what he was referring to? Jonathan, uh, do you want to tell us where you're referring that, or where's that number? Um, I just added it up from each department. So it was the travel lodging meals from every department, of which I think 11,250 was police and fire, and the rest was from the city, other parts of the city. Okay, thank you. So, Melissa, so go ahead and ask Michael combined. what you I want. Have, I have another question. Oh, okay. I wanted to, yeah, can you, can you point out where the, um, where the, let's see, where's my number? The 35.9% or the $132,000 reserve um, is, can you, can you show me which page that's on again, please? Are you talking to me? Oh, I was gonna ask Michael, I think. Well, either one is fine, I don't, it doesn't matter. I just am having a hard time with uh, flipping through 250 pages and finding stuff quickly. Do you, I'm happy, Jonathan, if you wanna answer it. 
I just did um, the math on the 35.9%, which I don't know where I saw the 35.9%. Okay. That's okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Michael, can you point it out, please, on the budget? I don't think it's actually in the budget book because it's not a factor we do, but it might be. Hold on. Let me find the... Faith, do you have the... Yeah, I don't think it's in the actual budget book. It's in the draft budget that we presented to you during the meeting. Okay. But you confirmed that, yes, that's correct. It sounds like you confirmed that that was correct. That's pretty close, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to make a note. Okay, so I guess Darrell, like, for this first set of items, not the reserve, but the other three, because that was already confirmed, or actually just the two, because the travel lodging, that was clarified, that that was um, combined, and about half of it is police and fire-ish. Um, I still think that there's, in the budget book, it's, it's conflicting with what you're saying about the code enforcement vehicle for the 2021 fiscal year. On that page 42, that capital request form, and that's creating a lot of confusion. Um, and also the cell phones sound like they're considerably more expensive than $7,000 if we're adding up all the separate line items. So I guess Michael? I'd like to discuss those, Darrell. Thank you. Michael, could you clarify on those two items? Sure. Uh, the CIP sheet isn't, isn't a really an official part of the budget, but that one is in error. Um, I think that was a leftover um, bullet from the FY20 sheet that didn't get updated. So that truck is already purchased in FY20 um, and the budgeted amount this year on 976 is for a replacement cruiser. So the CIP sheet was in error. So that's that one. As far as the cell phone goes, you'll notice that it's broken down into two different section. One is the police officer section itself. So for the uh, the officers and the other one is in the operating account. The officer one is the stipend that I was talking about that covers us not having to issue them phones. That's the $8,400. The $6,000 up in the operating expenses, that is the, um, the air cards or the G tax. So that's the cellular component of the officer's computers in their cars. That's how their computers um, communicate with dispatch. It's how they mark their positions. It's how they get directions from dispatch. So that's basically an air card for the officer's um, computers that they carry with them in their vehicle. So there's two different expenses because they're two different types of cellular service. They're both cellular products. It's just one is for their computers and their cars. One is actually for cell phones that they carry and make calls on. Um, could you, so could you clarify to the public in particular before um, we go back to the cell phone, the CIP or the requests are often different than the resulting budget item or the line item. So you would use the reference to CIP and I just want to make sure that the public understands what you were talking about. Sure. So the sheets in the front, they're basically capital request forms. The departments turn those in for what they want in future years for capital. So you see they go out um, uh, quite a few years beyond the budget, and that's because they're projecting capital costs out into the future. Um, they should match the budget in the current year. Uh, we try to make a match. Sometimes we miss things. In this particular case, we just missed this um, narrative on the top. So that should have been cleaned up. So that's just an error. Uh, but as far as the capital improvement goes, any of the out years are just projections, none of that's solid. So you can see in the next year, there's a vehicle that we budgeted for, or that we requested capital for 50,000, but it's not necessarily going to be put in the budget. Um, same across all the departments. Uh, those are probably more fluid in some of the bigger departments like water and sewer as we go through those, um, but they are not, um, they're not actually part of the budget, and i.e., when you approve the budget, I don't have the authority to go out in future years to buy those things. I only have the authority for the current budget. So it's not like we're approving all of those capital purchases for the next five years. When we approve the budget, it's only the items that are in this fiscal year, unless we decide to go to a multi-year budget. Um, so the, the capital requests are 
ideas, it should give us an idea and a future look. And anybody that looks at it will kind of have an idea of how we look to replace things, how we're looking to do things in future years, but none of it's actually real until it's approved in the budget. Chair Hoagland. Well, thank you. And Melissa, do you, I have a question just to add in since we're in law enforcement, um, mm -hmm. but I want you to finish uh, what you're asking. You were mentioning, was there anything else from that section? The only other thing from that section was um, there's some confusion about where the CARES Act funding has gone so far. So that's just offering that for you. That was the other point from that public comment. And I mean, I know from the CARES Act situation that I, I'm in within my work, um, it's somewhat complicated, but then it's not. So I'd love, Michael, I know we're going to be addressing the funding and how we'll be using the uh, CARES Act monies in the future um, and what we can use it for. Um, but could you do a quick answer to that, Michael? Sure, we've only received one um, reimbursement from the CARES Act so far, and that was for public safety salaries. So for fire and law enforcement, we got reimbursed a portion of their salaries, not to include benefits, um, and that totaled that $329,000. And that's how we went from a budgeted reserve of 29% to an actual reserve of 35%, because none of that reimbursement money was spent. Um, it all is just sitting currently in the reserve, and that's why that number is bigger. Uh, if we choose to spend that money as part of anything for CARES Act, then that will come right out of the reserve because that's where it ended up at the end of the fiscal year. So right now, that's tied. We do have requests in for further reimbursements. Um, it looks like we'll probably get at least the next set of reimbursements, uh, but those are not, um, they're not guaranteed, and we're not sure how much longer that'll continue. So we have not spent any CARES Act money so far. Um, it's currently just sitting in the reserve, uh, and that's why that's up to 35%. Chair Hoagland. Go ahead, Melissa. Can we get some clarification on how it's determined what will be submitted to be reimbur reimbursed by CARES Act funding? Like how those decisions are being made? Because those are not coming before the commission as far as I know. At least they haven't yet. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, we submit anything that we think the state would reimburse. So if there's any chance the state would reimburse us for the money, we submit it. They put out, the state puts out a great list. Um, if there's questions, uh, Paige calls them and says, hey, what about this? Could we submit this? Uh, so we're looking for every opportunity to submit anything we can for reimbursement out of the CARES Act. Is that enough information, Melissa? Yeah, I think so. Until we get to that point in the agenda, then we can talk more deeply about those topics. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do have a question on where it, in our budget line items is the um, fuel? Because I've had a statement made by a community member, and I know we've also heard this before in previous meetings, it's just been a while, that often the community is unhappy seeing um, our police and, and fire vehicles running nonstop, seemingly nonstop. And I would like to know where the, first of all, the fuel, and then where that fuel um, line item is, as well as, and what's the amount, as well as explaining the, the running of vehicles. And like I said, we've had this conversation in past meetings before, where public has brought it up and been frustrated to see it, um, see these vehicles running. So I would like um, that addressed because that was brought to me by the public. So Michael, that's yours, I think. Okay, you can look at, Faith has sucked that up on the, on the page and you can see it under each um, department. If you look under 236, it'll give you the cost for uh, line item 236. You'll see the cost for fuel, oil, and diesel. Uh, for FY20 and FY21, for the law enforcement, we budgeted $20,000. Uh, and I think we're projected to spend close to that for, F or we spent close to that for FY20. Um, 
as far as vehicles running, um, if you see fire trucks out running, it's because the diesels have to run a certain amount of time uh, to clean out the system. Um, and so that's why you'll see them either uh, idling out in front of the station or sometimes they take them uh, and just run them around town to, to get some miles on them and to let it burn out some of the, the diesel. Uh, the, unless they're on call, police vehicles won't be on except for the canine vehicle, obviously, to make sure that the air conditioning's on for the canine vehicle. Um, and then also uh, because there's a lot of drains on a police car battery as far as the camera goes, lights go, um, we have to be careful to, to make sure that we don't run the vehicles dead and they're dead when we go to respond. So there's, there's a lot of reasons that they're, they may be idling depending on where you see them. Um, and a lot of times they may have an officer in them idling. And so uh, all of those things are taken into considerations in the policy of when the vehicles run. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I know in the past we've had higher fuel usage because it depends on what the cost of gas is per gallon um, during the, the year where we've had higher uh, costs, but um, it looks like it's pretty balanced or at least pretty normally the, uh, near the same amount. Um, thank you for clarifying that. So other, any other things that we're missing for clarification at this time before we move to the next part? because we've been asked about the social worker and the potential for adding either the social worker um, as a extension um, of, the, of the police department. And then also it was brought up that there, let's see, I think, I'm trying to remember who said this, but how um, do we lessen that burden and is there potential for lessening the burden on the police who are dealing with the mental health issues because, and we know there's been a tumble down um, effect with lack of state funding like Quentin brought up and them cutting our budgets, leaving communities like ours without those resources. So what are, um, I guess, next steps or what are some possible steps for us looking at funding of someone who's sort of that in-between um, police and community and helping to bridge that and then also lessen the burden on the, com on the police. Any thoughts on that, Michael? That's a lot. Um, so I think there's a lot of models we can look at when we look at how other communities have tried to um, solve this problem. Uh, there are some restraints within the state of Montana as far as the state law goes and who can supervise um, social workers, mental health professionals. Uh, DPHS, DPHHS has to be involved in that process. Um, so if you look at Bozeman and Missoula, they have programs that I think are similar to what people are looking for, but none of those social workers work in the police department. Uh, they've partnered either with local agencies to do that or um, I think in Oh, I forget who Missoula uses, uh, but there's a couple of local agencies that do that. Um, we obviously have some resources as far as like a crisis response team, but right now our crisis response team is, is out of Bozeman, so they take a, a long time to get here if they come. Um, and that's part of this, the, the services that the state has pulled back. Uh, you can look at other communities like Billings. Um, Billings also has partnered um, with a, a local uh, provider of mental health services but they've actually funded it through a mill levy. So, uh, and I don't know if it's, I think it's Yellowstone County actually and not uh, Billings proper, but I have to double check on that. Um, so they actually passed a two mill, mill levy that has dedicated funding for social services in that case. That's a great model because one, it puts it in front of the voters so the community can decide that that's a priority. But two, you have an actual dedicated funding stream um, that can go towards that. It's not at the whim of, like CARES Act money is, is probably a one-time um, good deal. So if anything we fund with this this year, we may not be able to fund the next year. Uh, we run into the same kind of problems if we fund things through grants. Um, the early childhood coordinator was a great position that the city helped, um, helped provide for, but it was all grant funded. The city was only providing basically office space and benefits for that position. 
this year that grant funding has gone away, so we've lost that position altogether. Um, so without that kind of dedicated funding, long-term dedicated funding, it's sometimes hard to keep these services um, available and running through the community. So that's a different um, model that people use. Most, in fact, I don't think anywhere in the state do they have social, uh, social workers in law enforcement agencies, but they do partner with other agencies. So uh, if we want to move forward with this, that's probably what I would suggest is to look at those models, see what's working. But I think more importantly, do an analysis of where we think our gap is. Um, what is it that we're, what problem are we trying to solve? How often could we send a social worker instead of a, a police officer? Or how often would we have to send them both together? How would that work? Um, if you only have one social worker, what do you do after hours? Uh, how many would you need to have 24 hour coverage? I think there's a lot of administrative stuff you'd have to work through. Um, standard operating procedures for police officers with the social workers. Um, so there's a lot of issues that we would have to work through. Uh, I don't think that's impossible, but it will take some time. Um, and I think we might want to look at the, maybe the, the better place to, to place a social worker or a more appropriate place would be to see if we could place them in the health department. Um, so I think our choices are to partner with a local uh, mental health provider that already exists that's outside of government altogether. Or if we're looking for a government um, solution to this, then I think we look at seeing if we could expand the capacity of the health department where they could be under the supervision of DPHHS because the health board is already under the supervision of DPHHS. And that might help solve some of the um, legal issues as far as how it would work. Um, so I think those are the ways we could do that. We probably need some more information before we could put a dollar sign figure on that and figure out what to budget. Um, but I think those are ways we could move forward and try and figure out what the best solution is. Thank you. And um, there's also working with, you know, more of the granting aspects of our community. So I know there's entities that are supporting mental health, um, everything from the hospital to like Park County Community Foundation, as well as the schools. And there's liaisons that we work with even within the schools that tie um, school to struggling families and help. So it's like the burden issue. You, can, you only have so much time and, um, and you're, it, it's hard to take care of all those other pieces and parts that you know are important by having someone who is that um, in between has really helped us. Um, so there are other funding sources, just like we've had with early childhood coordinator uh, to potentially work with the city to add in a position that, that is more about mental health, working with the police. So there's potential for that. Um, commissioners, do you have any other thoughts on on that issue because that has been brought to all of us in one another. Um, Schwartz, go ahead. Just a reminder: grant funding, um, grant funding is great, but um, it doesn't last forever. And it, and it still goes back to the question of staffing at the police department. Um, do we have room to move an officer out and fund a social worker? Um, uh, like I brought up before, you know, counter or size or um, demographics and stuff like that. Um, are we at optimal uh, where we should be employment wise with um, policing, um, with officers? And uh, to me, that's a good question. And maybe Chief Johnson can speak to that or Michael. If I'm not, I'm not going too far afield here. Let me know if I am. Well, I think what what you're saying is that you're you're asking a part of it. Like where could funding come from? Is the funding is there funding potential for in a movement of an actual officer, um, or 
one less officer in what you just said. So I think it's all about the same issue. I think the answers can come from the, you know, Dale and Michael maybe on the, the funding or the, I'm sorry, the number of officers we have now and their importance to, you know, like percentage of population generally to um, uh, officer, whatever ratios. Um, I think they're all kind of connected. So I was discussing more about funding, some alternative funding and how the city can work within that and support it because I believe that it's, it's important and also possible. Um, but I also think there's, we need some answers on what Clinton is. Yeah, and I guess, you know, um, a simple question would be yes or no, you know. Um, um, and I'm sure the answer is no, you know. Um, uh, we have, you know, cover a number of shifts and stuff like that and try to keep overtime down and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, but alternative funding sources, but permanent funding sources, uh, what I'm looking for. Thanks. Michael? Sure. I think maybe the easiest way to, to illustrate this fact is, can you put page 154 back up, is to go back to the budget. Um, we've been operating a couple, well, it's tough to say because of some of the training going on, but we've been an officer down for a while. Um, and I think you see that if you would scroll down and look at uh, 120, which is overtime for the police department, you can see that this year we we budgeted. Oh, there you go. We budgeted thirty-five thousand dollars for overtime, but because we were short officers, we spent sixty thousand. That basically means we're not at an optimum level yet for coverage. Um, the less, when we're fully staffed, we will spend much less in overtime. We are still not fully staffed, uh, and you see that number projected in our overtime budget. Um, we're not at a point where if we cut an officer. Um, it will actually save us any money because we're going to end up paying that in overtime because we still have to cover the shifts. Even, even now, if you look at our, our schedule, there are, there are times um, during the week that we have one officer on duty, uh, which isn't ideal, right? It's just like we have one dispatcher occasionally in the dispatch center. Neither is ideal. Um, and really the only way to, to solve that problem is with more manning. Um, so it would be difficult to cut a position unless we wanted to cut a, a position that doesn't do standard patrol, but even they are available for, um, you know, emergency response during the day. So you know, during the day week, you look at posi posi positions like the detective, um, they are not a patrol officer, but they're doing a different function and you would lose that function if you cut them. So I, I don't think there's a whole lot of, of wiggle room or excess capacity in the, um, in the police department itself. So if we're looking to fund things, I think we probably need to look in other areas for that available funding to add capacity. I don't think we want to trade capacity as much as we'd like to add some capacity. Yeah, and 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 that's what I I guess I want the public to understand is you know where we're at, you know, and the overtime does become an issue and stuff like that. And uh, that we are staffed where we need to be and uh, we're gonna do something we need to add, not necessarily take away. That's that's my personal opinion. Thank you. And can you clarify, Michael, on the ratio? What is our normal, what is our, per community size, what is our ratio and why? A lot of it isn't, isn't based on ratio per se, but actual ship coverage, because no matter how many people you have, you still are going to want 24 hour ship coverage. Uh, so, we, the way we schedule is we try to maximize officer availability during what we call high volume times. So you, you can imagine what they are, right? Weekend nights, um, uh, you know, it's, it's areas like that. So that's where we overlap shifts. So really the manning isn't based so much on a ratio of um, population as it is to shift coverage. Uh, I would, you know, we have, I mean, if you want to learn ratio, I'll do public math, which is always dangerous. Um, if we're approximately 8,000 people right now, 
Uh, we've got about one police officer for every 571 citizens. Is that normal? What is, what's average like in other communities? My guess is there isn't really an average. Um, it's gonna vary greatly from smaller communities to larger communities. Um, I couldn't tell you what the ratio is in New York, uh, but I bet you it's, it's more than 571 people per officer. Uh, but, but they also have no trouble having multiple officers on shift anytime during the day uh, and others on call. And they have you know, many more departments. Um, I bet you, I, I'd have to look up Bozeman, but I'm sure they have, uh, as you get to larger cities, they're gonna get more specialized uh, task force, whether that's SWAT teams or um, you know, riot control or whatever else larger departments have. So there's gonna be more, more police officers per uh, citizen in some of those mid-sized cities as they start to add functions. Uh, but my guess is it varies greatly, greatly per city, greatly per state, um, probably even within the state. Yeah, and that's why I mentioned demographics, uh, you know, it's a particular. You're sort of cutting out, Quentin. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's why I asked, you know, especially with our demographics or um, where we're at and stuff like that. You know, I know it's going to change from New York City to from Bozeman to Livingston to, you know, Harleton. Um, that, that, I guess that's the answer I was looking for is, you know, are we staffed where we should be? And um, I can't see taking away for an officer, but I, I would sure would like to budget for a social worker in that department in the future. And uh, somehow we have, I would like to find a way to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Quentin. Okay, any other um, commissioner comments or questions just on that, uh, that section and that issue? Chair? This is my dog, Juniper. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> I have a follow-up question to Quentin's question. So it sounds like we have 14 officers based on public math. Um, do you're saying that we're understaffed how many more officers are you budgeted to hire for the Livingston Police Department we currently have one open position thank you do we have any can I add, add to that Melissa do we have any um officers in the uh in school right now um not right now because school's not in session, but if, yeah. <laughs> as soon as the school year starts, yes. Yeah. So if we look at our, our additional duty officers or officers that are pulling in additional duties outside of patrol, we have the canine officer, um, the school resource officer, the detective, and um, the uh, code enforcement officer. Also, my staff is super quick and they did some Google searching for you. Uh, for jurisdictions between 25 and 50,000, which is bigger than us. Uh, the average police officers per 10,000 population is 17, and the total personnel in the police department for those cities is 21.2 uh, per 10,000 people. Okay, so we're slightly less. Um, well, I also heard police academy closed because of COVID two days ago. Whatever that is, I'm not sure. But um, okay, can we move on at least from that for information gathering? Um, so set another issue that has been brought up, and this was brought by the commission and the community, is the warming center. Um, could can we address possible funding routes and solutions to supporting that further? Michael. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I think the warming center is one of those issues that we don't have a lot of information on yet. Um, I know they're looking at bringing out their, um, their feasibility report for the year uh, to the, um, uh, the, it's not the housing commission, but uh, 
Barb could tell me what their, their name is, but the community group that's working on affordable housing. So I think that's something we could definitely be a part of and see what they're looking for in feasibility this year. Um, I know last year they averaged about two people per night uh, until the, the month of March. And the average cost, I think, was $226 per person per night. Um, so it's, it's, fairly, it's a fairly expensive solution per capita, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we don't wanna be involved, but I think we just need to look and see how we wanna partner with them. Um, I know the city used to have a voucher program uh, that was run for, uh, for people that were without homes or were just passing through town. Um, and that might be a viable solution that we could look at. For $226 per person per night, we certainly could uh, do something like hotel vouchers where they would have a room and a shower and possibly a meal, um, which might also help some of the local businesses. Uh, and that's a scalable solution, possibly really in the time of COVID-19 when we may not wanna do mass shelters uh, where we put a bunch of people together in one space. Um, a solution like that might be preferable in the fact that it, it keeps people a little more separated and socially distanced on a night. So I think there's a lot of solutions on that page. In fact, I think Missoula actually just bought a hotel um, to use in the short term as their uh, as a homeless shelter because of COVID-19. They were trying to go away from mass shelters. Um, so they were using the hotel uh, that they purchased short term for during the COVID-19 crisis. And then long term, they were looking to either redevelop it or sell it off to a developer. Um, so I think it's absolutely something we can look at. I just think we need to wait for HRDC to come up with their plan for the year, see how we can participate in it, and see if there might be more cost effective or better solutions uh, in the age of COVID where um, you know mass, mass shelters may not be the answer. But I think that's absolutely something we can go forward with as they move forward. Oh, sorry. Commissioners, do you have any um, other questions or statements on that? Because I know it was it has been brought up by Melissa Quinton. You have brought the warming and funding the warming um, center. Yeah, thanks, Drell. I um so I it was first brought up to me when Marissa Hackett was still here, actually. So it was quite some time ago before COVID, but I've been going to all the community housing meetings that Michael referenced and um, no, they haven't done a fees, they haven't presented their feasibility study yet, but HRDC has told me that they are working on the feasibility study and there would be changes this year. Um, they're still figuring it out, but what Michael said is consistent to the general information that I've gotten where they might have to look at things like hotels um, to keep people safe during a pandemic. Um, and it sounds like HRDC really wants to be involved in these conversations and they really want to share with us what they learned. If you remember at the end of the last meeting, the seven hour meeting, they did mention um, a number of topics that they would be willing to talk to the city commission about. Everything from what, you know, the feasibility study or what homelessness looks like in Park County and other topics. So I think it's definitely, um, something that we should keep conversing with them about and like listening to what their needs are before we offer too many solutions, like seeing what's going to actually work for them and be feasible. Um, but I definitely, it's, it's a, it's a problem that is, it can be acute, but long-term acute problem for some members of the community. Um, so it's not a forever solution, but it's certainly like a solution that helps people in time of crisis. And I think right now we're all in crisis and based on things that Quentin has said too, I think you know, it might not be surprising if we see the demand is greater this year than what it's been in the pilot study year. <coughs> Thank you, Melissa. Any other commissioner comments, Quentin, or final thoughts on the warming center issue and potential? No, yeah, my, um, Commissioner Schwartz here. Um, yeah, Michael brought up a good point. You know, cost per uh, cost per person—that is something to always look at. And I, 
I know as a board member of Meals on Wheels, we've uh, um, been willing to donate meals um, to that program and stuff like that to help you know bring down costs and stuff like that. But yeah, in the time of COVID, um, I have never been in that facility. And I don't know how tight it is, but hotel voucher would go a long way. And we, we just need to, you know, look at all these options and have them on the table because I got a feeling we, this is going to get worse before it gets better as far as, you know, people having a place to, um, to lay their head and get a meal. Thank you. I yield. Thank you, Quentin. Um, Let's see. Just checking. Oh, another issue and major question that has been brought up in this in this meeting and others is the housing action plan and the request for that. And I I would love to understand even more what that looks like. And I know one of the things we're we're at right now is a cusp of change with our growth policy um, not being quite complete. We have a lot of work in it already. We're getting information, but um, what are some possible routes to, for the city in helping a, a housing action plan? Who is, who can possibly do that? And who would we budget? Is it, is it an entity within the city that would work towards this? Is that possible or is that something we pass to to one of our committees. Um, I need some understanding of how we could possibly use all that information from the growth, growth policy, the wants and needs of the community, and then um, where do we move forward with a uh, housing action planner? Is that possible? And who, who kind of leads that? Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think this is a great one, um, and it may turn out to be easy and possibly free if we do it right. Um, I think absolutely this is something that ties into the growth policy, and we wait for the, the results of the growth policy and then can move into a housing action plan. But Missoula has already done the, the lion's share work on this. Um, they have both a, um, a study that was commissioned by a, a collaboration of the city the Chamber of Commerce and the Realtors Association um, that did an in-depth analysis of Missoula, but there's a chapter in there of recommendations that I think is really applicable to almost any municipality in Montana, possibly anywhere. Um, there's some really great suggestions in there. And then Missoula went on after receiving that study, they actually then created a housing policy where they picked parts of that study to implement. Um, and I think that's a great model to use. And I think we may not have to reinvent the wheel on this one um, because a lot of the recommendations are very practical and very um, portable from one community to another. Some examples are uh, to reduce the, um, reduce the barriers to uh, building uh, accessory dwelling units, to provide uh, incentive for higher density uh, development. It's, and they have some very specific ways to do that. Some of them would apply to us, some of them wouldn't. Um, some of them we could do, some of them we don't have the funds to accomplish, but there's an entire, uh, you know, there's an entire list of actions that we could take to help address housing in our community. I think once we have the growth policy in place, um, we could then review that. I think that probably the planning board is a great place to start. Um, we've actually started on some of the actions in their um, housing study. We actually have those underway currently, so we're already taking some steps towards this, but we review their action plan and then look at their policy and see how they chose to implement it and see how well that aligns with our needs and our resources here in Livingston. Um, they spent about, I, I think, between thirty-five dollars and $40,000 on that study, uh, which is something, and that luckily they put it online so we can easily poach it. Uh, and that might be just a, an easy way and a cheap way for us to be able to fulfill that need. And then if we look at it and we say, you know what, it's really good, but it doesn't quite fulfill specifically what we want here in Livingston, then we can look at, at doing our own and we'd have you know, a good idea of what it would look like and specifically how we'd wanna change it. So I think there's some, there's some goodness in that and, and using, using some stuff produced by Missoula or Bozeman or Billings uh, that have a little bit bigger budget than us and just being able to incorporate them into our planning. 
Can I ask a follow-up question? Yes, please. What's it called, Michael? I'm trying to look it up and I'm not fine. I mean, I've se I'm seeing like the initiatives or the policy, but I wanna know the document that you're referencing, what it's called, please. Sure, there's two of them. So one of them is, um, yeah, if you would show them real quick, that'd be great. Uh, if you give me just a minute to hunt them down. All right, so this is the first one. Can you scroll down on that one a little bit? I want to see if it's the... So there's, yeah, so there's two of them. This is the actual study. Um, and it was, there you can see it was done by Worldwide Associates. So they were actually com community development consultants. And that's the one, what was the title of this one? Making Missoula Hall. So that's the study itself. And then if you can click on the next one, um, a place to call home, meeting Missoula's housing needs is actually their policy that they implemented. Uh, so that's their, their Office of Housing and Community Development. Um, it's one of their publications approved by their commission. So those are the two, um, two products that they've produced. I'd like to see the links to those. Is that something that you can email the commission? Sure, I can email those out tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just having a hard time finding the website for one of them. And just a reminder, Chair Hoagland, we have about 30 minutes left on this meeting because it was noticed to end at eight. And I'm on mute. Yes, I was just thinking about that. Okay, Melissa, you still have the floor. Is there anything else? I mean, I think it's useful. I, first of all, I think I'm really excited about the idea of a housing action plan and I wanna tell you why. I think that it's um, a housing action plan is like a sustainable way to think about the biggest problems that are facing people in our community right now. Um, and, it, and it helps us, I think, as a commission with a path forward. Um, because this is one of the topics that has come up before I was a commissioner, this just this esoteric, like overwhelming problem of how are we ever going to solve the housing challenges in Livingston. And then right now everything's compounded by COVID and it's so much work worse. We're already losing citizens. People are already being displaced from their homes just over the last few months. And it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so I think this is a way for the commission to really, invest money in the issues that are important to the citizens that live here. Right now, we do certainly do what we can here and there, like maybe a variance for a, a variance for the small manufactured homes, or maybe um, helping with applying for a grant for this other project, but it's relatively on a small scale. And it's not really getting at the variety of homes that we're needing for people in Livingston. Because we, while we do need affordable housing, we certainly need a lot more than just capital A affordable housing. We know our rental market is saturated. We know there's not a lot of diversity in homes. We know people want more than just single family homes and those kinds of housing opportunities are just not available. So I think a housing action plan really, um, really helps us understand what we have and like what our goal is and how are we going to get there. Um, well, I do think it's useful to look to places like Missoula, Billings, and Bozeman. I'm not, I'm not totally sold on only using those. Granted, I haven't done a deep dive into these documents, but the reason why I'm not totally sold on those at the moment is, I mean, I've lived in Missoula and I, Missoula was in a housing crisis when we left Missoula um, and their housing challenges while there is overlap, there's also pretty big differences in what we're facing in Livingston and Park County overall. Like Gardner is a great example, and, part, and I know that's not our jurisdiction, but that's a fine example of the kind of challenges we face in Livingston, which is this, this vacation, um, these pressures from being a tourist town. And we certainly have that in ways that Missoula doesn't have, just based on the pressures relative to the size of our community. So. Um, that's why I think a specific housing action plan for our town 
could be useful because while we do have some overlap and I would expect to see some overlap, we also have different challenges. Missoula is a college town. Bozeman's a college town. There's going to be more diversity in houses there. There's a lot more apartments, um, you know, relative to single family homes. There's a lot more variety. So I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all. Um, otherwise, Missoula, Billings, and Bozeman would have just used each other's plans if it was that easy. Um, so I would like to see, I would like to see this addressed because I think this is something the commission can do that actually gets at one of the issues that's been central for us and that we've kind of been like, how do we ever, how do we ever meet this challenge? Like it's overwhelming for a city that doesn't have a housing department, which some of these bigger cities do. And it's overwhelming for commissioners to have to do this on a volunteer basis. Um, some ideas would be, I think that um, coming together for a housing action plan, it does cost money to hire contractors, but it can look a lot of different ways. Um, I believe that this Park County Housing Coalition that HRDC and um, Park County Community Foundation might have this on a future agenda. I saw their agendas a while back, like a year at a glance or something, and Barbara Oldershaw is actually on the line. I wonder, Darrell, if we could ask her if that's something that's coming up because while they do look at Park County, we're within Park County and maybe that would help us offset the cost or um, do it in a way that's efficient if, if the city could partner with the county instead of just doing it on our own. Could we ask her? Would you be able to open it up to her or are you willing? Yes, just ask. Um... Barb, just a quick question and answer, if possible, on um, what what information you have regarding that coalition of people and what work they are planning. Sure. Thanks for your interest. So, the housing coalition work that we're doing is multifaceted. We've starting with this series of meetings uh, on Thursday. August 27th that we'll be meeting four out of six after in addition to those meetings we're also starting to gather information to figure out which are the right questions to be answered when we do a housing needs assessment and then we're going to get together a housing working group and they will be uh, using the information from the needs assessment to determine what are the appropriate uh, solutions because it's um, as Melissa pointed out it's very much not a one-size-fits-all kind of a situation that there are many 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 different uh, strategies and tactics for approaching a housing crisis similar to what we have but the important thing is to determine well what is uh, what is the core issue at hand so um, in some cases, it's uh, home buyers, uh, first time home buyers needing education or assistance with down payments. In some cases, it's a need for housing for seasonal employees. Uh, so it's our goal with the needs assessment is to really uh, drill down to figure out what are the particular housing issues here in Park County and including in Livingston so that when we start to develop solutions, we're addressing the correct challenge. Okay. Darrell, I see your lips moving, but I don't hear you. Oops, sorry. Um, Melissa, do you have anything else on that? I have some thoughts too. Um, I guess one thing, that appeals to me about taking a really local look, and I believe this has come out, come up in the coalition, is this idea that like, what happens in Livingston um, and what happens in the county affect each other. So like if Livingston has some really specific ordinances that cause people immigrating to this county to rather, like they would rather build in the county than come into town like those sorts of like differences in policy at the county versus the city level are important to keep in mind, I think, as we're thinking about housing. Um, so that's one reason that I also think it's important to look local and, and if there is already a forum for these broader conversations for like 
Gardner and Shields Valley and like what's happening and across Park County. I think that could be useful for us as city commissioners. The other thing um, that's not related to what Barb said was um, when we're thinking about policy, Missoula, Billings, and Bozeman are all charter forms of government and we're not. So that's the other thing that stands out to me. I don't, I don't want to get advice for things that we can't do because we're still not a charter form of government. And so if we're looking for solutions and they're operating in a different framework for local government than we are, then we're, it's a missed opportunity for us. So. Yeah, good point. I, I will um, feed off of that and thank you, Barb. I did say thank you, but I think I was on mute. Um, thanks for that information. Um, what I look forward to in, in the future of this planning is the teaming with other entities. And how I see the role of the city in this is if we're, so like this, is, I, I've been writing a to-do list of information that I um, gleaned from this meeting and from this budget meeting about how do we fund, how do we move forward with some of these priorities and I think working with, first of all, with some solutions with the county, potentially the, um, this coalition, but using our growth policy and, and our um, planning board to look at all the details of our growth policy in relationship to our ordinances, as well as working with the city staff to get there, I see us all kind of getting to the same place. And what I'm huge into and what I so love about our community is that we, we work really well together overall. There's always the naysayers and the complainers who say we're doing nothing, but I don't agree. And what we have here is potential to really change something within our community by utilizing, you know, really five very powerful, great, groups of people um and so i would like us to see or to work towards an action plan how detailed that is how much money it costs at this time we don't know but i think we start with the information we're gathering from the coalition working with they could present to the planning board after the growth policy they could start that conversation we can work with the, with them to then move this forward um, and get it done. Um, anything else before, I think we have to get into the place of uh, finishing up. And I feel like we went, I checked off all of the statements, issues, questions that were stated <clears throat> and that I think, but I don't know if I missed anything. And I, that's why I was hoping the commissioners were helping write down. Um, but I have a to-do list to address. So who's, uh, anyone else, commissioners, anything else we missed from our list and uh, priorities and um, community feedback? Yeah, Darrell, I think um, I'm looking at more than one list. We still have to address this CARES Act list, which will be a different time probably. But um, the other thing that came up was parks and trails that we haven't talked about. Um, um, Sarah, Sarah brought it up somewhat and I mean, we addressed the smaller question, but. The priority spending or the priority list that is. Yeah, but um, Patricia also brought up uh, parks and trails. So there were a couple of people that brought up the idea of funding parks and trails because that is on the strategic plan as well. But I know that that's also on an upcoming commission agenda, I think. Um, or I think it's on an upcoming edition, uh, bleh, upcoming commission agenda. Michael, um, do you remember if that one is? I don't think there's any parks and trails on any of the upcoming city commission meetings. So I thought we made, I made a motion and Darrell, I thought seconded it a while back. Um, so I think it was gonna come up, but maybe this fall in relation to active transportation and trail connectivity. And impossible funding sources and the, what the city uh, 
what are some options in the future? Because we talk about this every year and we kind of move forward in these teeny tiny step steps. And that's when, and that was when Commissioner Schwartz brought up, um, it sounds like Parks District has been brought up as one potential source of revenue, but um, yeah, we were, we wanted that on an agenda, I thought. Did, am I misremembering or does somebody else remember that we? I remember. It's on the 15th September agenda. It's a, okay. still a, a month out, but it's. Okay. Okay. But it's in, the, it's in the pipeline is what I was thinking. So I don't know how much time we want to spend on it here if we already have it in the pipeline to, of things coming up. Yeah. I think that we, we can wait for the priorities from the parks and trails. We can talk about you know, the work that city can do in the future to um, work with parks and trails in the community and developing the system and or the parks, did, et cetera. And we'll just wait until we address it during the next commission meeting or that commission meeting. Um, anything else then that we missed? <clears throat> so from, I guess we're at a place of, we still have our budget. We have our, you know, priorities that were in the budget and um, addressed as far as the needs of the city and the commission um, in various ways. One of the, the to-do lists that I'm seeing that doesn't necessarily impact the budget immediately, but I think we need to make sure that we move forward. And this is my opinion. So I'm just stating my opinion. So from the to-do list that I gleaned today is we have a want for housing action plan, working with the planning board, um, the coalition and county, as well as waiting for the growth policy to be complete to help drive um, that planning and um, the potential change for it. Um, uh, second to do is teaming with and, and well working at finding funding sources and teaming with the county PC um, Park County Community Foundation mental health um, community mental health hospital on uh, how can we fund a possible uh, social worker working with the city to help be that um, liaison between the police and the um, struggling community members. Um, hold on, getting there. Uh, the warming center waiting on HRDC and, and working with HRDC. I know we right. also didn't bring up, but churches were a major part of the, the program in the past and including doing some of the sheltering in when needed and having that um, in churches. I you know a lot of communities do that, but working with H HRDC and the other entities, but the, we, what I'm saying is I think we want to see the teaming and, the, and, and possibly what does that mean for funding? We don't know yet and work more with the teams. Um, but that all could be amended in the future for some within our budget. Yep. There's, there's other sources of, um, that we have potential sources. At this moment, I think we've had, you know, we have a pretty lean budget overall, but we still expect as a commission and a community that we still that we work towards getting our finding solutions for these issues. And is it in funding through having to amend the budget in the future? That might be part of it. Um, or is it grants working within the community and with, uh, within the city? Am I off base, anyone? From what, gleaning the information from today's meeting? Mm -hmm. um, Darrell Quint, Commissioner uh, Schwartz. Um, I think you're spot on, you know, and uh, and this housing, um, this whole housing thing is going to come down to public-private partnership. Um, we as a city, there's no way we can fund 
that I know of that we fund anything independently without, you know, private money and stuff like that. And uh, um, some organizations have really stepped up and uh, like Blue Bunch, uh, Bunch Flats is a good example. Um, the recent purchase of the uh, main hotel, we just need to keep going. And we need to um, somehow find the state to uh, incentivize incentivize these things and also um, this the whole mental health or health issues and stuff in the county we really need to work on our work on our state legislators and state senators to really you know start bring back what we've lost and uh, that's about all I have to say that thank you I yield and I agree that um, communities can help in that um, cities you know, we send people to the legislature, we make calls, um, commissioners can help change uh, and hope, um, hopefully help to fund better these entities that um, have been cut. Um, one last one on the, the ex this is sort of off budget, but I want to just state it to the public because I know it's extremely important and we do have it in our planning we will talk about it at the next commission meeting in some way or another, but that is the police community forum that has been requested by both the commission and the community and talking about policy. Um, I mean, I have my, my big document here, you know, this is what we have to review and thinking about what we're doing well and um, what do we want to improve on and having the community part of that conversation for um, for uh, the safety of our officers and people. Um, so we, we do have that scheduled. I, I just want to state that to the community. There's only so many hours in the day and I know that there's a lot on our plate and I think this commission has a lot that they ask for in and I think in a good way that um, so patience, please, as we find the time and um, commit to uh, this forum and other public meetings that we'll need to have in the future, including growth policy. Um, I, we could go on and on. Um, so where are we at today as far as next steps? Can I bring something up for you? Yes. Sure. Okay. Just to clarify. So we have a commission meeting on Tuesday and then we're going to have another special commission meeting just about the budget on Thursday. Correct. Is that well, what everybody have, else's calendar? Okay. Yeah, so plans, just, depending on um, how much work we got done today and how far, and then as well as um, addressing some other issues um, at the next one, instead of having it all at one time. And then the vote for the budget, the next vote for the budget, if I'm remembering correctly, will happen on September 1st. Is Michael, that correct? Can you okay. clarify some of our... I, I see him nodding, I think. Can we get a thumbs up? Okay, cool. So, the, thank you. So, the reason I want to point that out is because I, it was important to me personally that we schedule that police policy from the community forum meeting before we vote on the final budget. And so I just want to make that clear that that is the order of events. What you just named is we will be scheduling that as requested before we vote on the final budget. We might not get through all the conversations before we're able to vote just because this is basically volunteering for all of us and we have jobs um, and we can't fit everything in right away. But I just, I really wanted to clarify that, that we are indeed scheduling it before we're done talking about the budget. So thanks for confirming that. And we can bring it up at the next commission meeting, which is just on. Thank you. All right, so next steps tonight. Michael, I need some guidance on where are we uh, really, it just depends. Do you want to put forth any amendments to the budget? Um, do you want to have additional conversations on um, any, the CARES Act revenue or possible expenditures? Um, 
I don't, those don't necessarily have to be done right now. They're not part of the budget process, so we can do that at any time. Um, so really, I think the, the most important part is to see if you want to offer any amendments to the budget currently, and if you want to continue with the meeting on the, what do we schedule it for, the 20, 20th? 20th? I'm wondering if we, um, we try to talk, have, I know our agenda is going to be so big. Um, on our next agenda for city commission, could we have an update on CARES money funding, uh, just a, a, either a city manager update, which I think either we're gonna, going to address that at the next budget meeting that we already have scheduled, along with anything else that we've missed or um, that budget uh, based, or we could have an update and sort of break it into parts and pieces along the way. What do you guys think? And if we have gonna, minutes. If we're gonna have an agenda this Tuesday, like our last agenda, I don't wanna add anything to it. I would rather go Thursday and talk about CARES Act funding on Thursday, and then we can discuss it in the way that you already outlined. That would be my preference. And then also we could do potentially amendments on that Thursday meeting as well, since we're short on time here. We could, and also remember everyone that we can add amendments to our budget throughout the year, depending, and I mean, funding is, you know, the pocket is so deep, but there's needs that arise, especially if we have a to-do list that then we know this is a need and that this is how we as a community or as a city can contribute to that need. Um, we can amend the budget. So it, it's not like a cut and dry, this is actually, there is potential. Although, like I said, there's not always a deep pocket to, to reach for. Am I right in that, Paige and or Michael? Yes. Okay, so do we have any amendments in this tonight's amendments to the budget tonight that any commissioner wants to request? Commissioner Schwartz, um, I do not, um, but it'd be, uh, I'd like to see a, maybe a priority uh, list on our CARES Act funding, where we really, where the city um, department heads and stuff think that money should really go, where it should go to, and uh, um, just, you know, in a general aspect, not, uh, you don't have to dive too deep in the weeds, but what do you think our priorities are with that money or and uh like you said a lot of it is, is reimbursement for you know stuff we've had to do dealing with this thank you i agree um i'd like to see a priority list i know it's going to be the beginning of the priority list because as things come up and as we um get more information from the state and the federal government as you know it, there may be more funding that comes there may be you know more, but we'll have, um, you know, updates that will be needed along the way. Um, Michael, do you think you can have for that next budget meeting um, kind of an overview of the CARES fund funding, CARES Act funding? The funding or priorities for spending? Both. <laughs> uh, well, the funding is actually in this one. Um, everything we know is on page 237 of this agenda. Uh, so there's, as far as that goes, I do think that that additional reimbursement was approved today. So um, I think we get a, an additional 187,000, if I did the math right, um, should be coming into the general fund. Um, and then the, the priorities as listed by the commission are on page 234. Um, of those, there's only about three that are city funded. Do you want me to try to prioritize the commissioner's inputs or just prioritize the city staff inputs? I think both. And, but I think we need to do that during that next budget meeting, like Melissa was stating. I think I just wanted to make sure you had, you feel like we have time between now and then to sort of put this discussion into a um, presentable way for the commission and the community. 
Um, is there something more than you than the chart on page 234 that you would like? Um, I'd have to look at it in, in detail. Is there anything else on, I feel like tonight we don't want to necessarily go through it. Obviously we're out of time, but um, I think we will, we can add commissioners and community can uh, communicate to us and commissioners communicate to you if there's anything that else that they would like to be addressed that's not there yet but we don't really have the time to go through that tonight um but we'll we'll address this part of the budget or budgeting process at the next meeting and the steps and any more information that are need that's needed prayer okay um, any other, anyone wanting to make any amendments to this budget? Uh, Commissioner, maybe, uh, no. No. Right? Mellon and yeah, uh, no, Warren, no. 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 Um, I agree, I would like to see some of the work and then amending the budget as needed in the future, depending on the results of the work that we're doing um, and the needs. Melissa, anything on, from you? Um, I think we still have time the next meeting to discuss some amendments after we go over CARES Act, but um, I yes. do, I believe strongly in partnerships I believe very strongly in working with other community groups to overcome some of these problems. So we almost need like a plan. If we're not gonna amend the budget, we almost need a plan of action. Like how are we gonna follow up and not let these things fall through the crack? Um, and I, that's just yeah. my, my initial thoughts. We need to add a strategic plan that we haven't finalized. That will help lead the plan. In the planning. Um, all right, so there's no amendments to tonight's budget, uh, or tonight, I should say. Um, so uh, any, any final thoughts in your last 60 seconds? I'm gonna have a stop on time and do it. Thank you for a very well run meeting. Oh, thank you, Quentin. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, really appreciate the public uh, feedback and love having the staff. We hardly ever get this many of our staff members in on a meeting. So thank you, Paige, Dale, um, Chief. I'm trying to see who else I'm missing. And, uh, and Faith, of course, our helper. And Lisa. I saw Lisa oh, earlier. Lisa. Lisa's there. Yep. So thank you for, for joining us and giving us your feedback community. This meeting, this special meeting, uh, budget meeting is now adjourned at eight o'clock. Goodbye. <laughs>